All right, here we go. This is gonna be terrible. Welcome to the Narcicast, where we will go through all of the Studio Ghibli films in chronological order to deliver a discussion and analysis that is worthy of them. Your hosts today are Ziv, the Flower Boy. Introduce yourself. Hey guys, uh, I'm Ziv. <laughs> and you do study Japanese, right? Yeah, I study Japanese in uh, at Leiden University. So I thought it would be really interesting to uh, do my own takes from that perspective. That does indeed sound interesting. And next up we have Darkonius, our local mecha expert. Hello, I'm Darkonius. I'm the old fag enthusiast, the, da the Takahata detractor, and I can't talk, as you can tell. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Great. And here we have Platon Skull. Hi, uh, you can just call me Platon. Uh, I study film and media studies at uh, Copenhagen University, and... Uh, I'm uh, here to talk a lot. <laughs> Hopefully. Next up, Hipster Cthulhu. Um, I'm the guy who also didn't think of writing an intro. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say now. Shit. Flipping through my notes, frantically searching for a gag. Can't find one. Uh, I guess I'll just say that I'm a run-of-the-mill weeaboo. I don't even know why I'm here. I feel like I'm pretty much underqualified considering everyone else on the cast. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, we have me, Niat. And I also have a university background. I study English and computer science at the University of Potsdam. So, and I also run this humble YouTube channel here where we are uploading this podcast. So, let's get into it, guys. Yeah, so, so, um, so uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is uh, technically uh, not a Studio Ghibli film, but it's it's basically the first uh, film that Studio Ghibli made before they were Studio Ghibli. Yeah. Wait, can I get, do one more introductory remark? So we're clear. <laughs> of yeah, course, sure. yeah. Go ahead. Well, I want to do a remark for the uh, anime community or anything, anyone from Anitube watching this. You might find this podcast to go very in-depth about some things and maybe very pretentious even. But I want to clarify that there's a, a, a difference between intellectualism and elitism, which uh, we all disavow. Well, obviously, so, elitism is good and intellectualism is bad. That's obvious. Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> so, yeah, we will go into depth. We will um, discuss all kinds of details, all kinds of academic background, everything. But don't let that scare you off. We we'll, We guarantee that this is all very interesting. And we'll all do our our best to make it as accessible as possible for everyone. So don't be discouraged by um, that thought. That's all I want to say. What Ziff is saying is, don't be afraid if you realize you have a peon-sized brain and our takes are just far too like high-minded for you. It's okay, <laughs> you're here to learn. They're actually really not. We're just a bunch of idiots trying to think too hard about stuff in reality, so... So, resident elitist hipster Kusulu versus resident intellectualist Ziff. Fight. <laughs> I would like to assume my crown as the resident elitist. I'll, well, I'll I mean, the I, crown. I, th I thought hipster was a proof that we weren't elitist. <laughs> we allowed him All in. right. So, what you were saying is that, yeah, Nausicaa isn't a Studio Ghibli film technically, but, I mean, they have, uh, they have bought up the rights for Nausicaa themselves later on because it marks a really important point, a starting point to their legacy, basically. And you have some, something to say about that, right, Platon? Ex exactly. This, um, this is the starting point of uh, uh, Miyazaki's uh, feature film career, especially uh, in terms of Studio uh, Ghibli, which it's also a starting point for. Um, and we're, we're of course, going to be talking a lot about uh, Miyazaki uh, these uh, coming months, uh, b because like he and uh, and Takahata uh, are the heart and soul of Studio Ghibli. Um, uh, but but before we really get into it, uh, I think it's worth talking about uh, the merits of uh, of looking at the uh, the author uh, rather than or uh, in in concert with the work. Uh, now uh, this uh, gets into a, a pretty uh, pretty old uh, idea in uh, in film theory called uh, auteur theory, um, which uh, is a, a French term basically meaning author or uh, creator of a work. 
It was uh, coined in 1954 uh, by uh, Jean-Luc Godard uh, as, as a way to legitimize uh, film as an art form, basically saying that the director is the core author of a work, and uh, and you can uh, and you can see and analyze uh, film through uh, the lens of the director as this uh, special, yes, this special snowflake uh, thing. Um, which uh, actually di did go a long way to legitimize the art form, uh, although uh, auteur theory has its limits, where, which I'll get into. Um, and essentially, Miyazaki is the first, uh, at, at least uh, in the Western conception, the first uh, recognizable auteur of anime. Um, and, uh, and, and just like how the original auteur theory was created to legitimize a film as an art form, uh, Miyazaki, uh, the, at least our conception of him as this uh, brilliant genius creator, uh, has legitimized um, anime as an art form for many people uh, in the West. Um, and Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and uh, actually his entire uh, body of work is a pretty good argument for uh, auteur theory because uh, he has all the characteristics we uh, traditionally associate with uh, auteurism. Um, he has very specific uh, styles and sensibilities that are recognizable. He has uh, themes he uh, really likes uh, uh, diving into and uh, repeating. He has uh, certain motifs uh, that go again and again, uh, and we'll get into all of them, but uh, just a, a quick list of uh, elements of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which well, we'll see a lot more from um, uh, we'll see a lot more from Miyazaki. His, uh, of course, that's his, his art style and uh, aste uh, aesthetic flourishes. Uh, stuff like w what we call the the Ghibli girl, the the puffy hair when people get angry, uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, there's uh, flight. His um, his really uh, nerdy interest uh, and childlike fascination with the uh, concept of flight and flying machines. Uh, there's anti-war messages uh, and uh, pacifistic uh, messages. There's his uh, really, um, really strong anti-industrialism and uh, radical environmentalism. There's a uh, moral ambiguity to the story. Uh, that this uh, we do have kind of an evil empire, but there's but the villain isn't as clear as it uh, might be in. Uh, in, in other animation works. Uh, and obviously that's uh, the character of Nausicaa, who's uh, the first Ghibli girl, and there's these uh, really acti active female characters. Um, uh, and, and all of this is going to uh, come up again and again, and uh, we're going to get more in-depth with a lot of it uh, later on, uh, both in this episode and later in the podcast series. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, we have to recognize that there's a, a limit to... Um, what we can say about Miyazaki through his work. Uh, auteur theory has gotten a lot of uh, criticism for being uh, basically uh, a bit of a master masturbatory fantasy uh, made up by egotistical uh, French uh, directors, which it is, kind of. Yeah. Um, uh, and also there's the, the, uh, the famous um, film critic Pauline Kael, uh, who pointed out uh, that we should judge the artist by the movie and not judge the movie by the artist. In other words, um, we, 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 can, uh, we, we can't just say that because it's a Miyazaki work, it's significant, it, it has really big value. We have to talk about it on its own terms. And of course, later, later on, we have this idea of the death of the author, which um, I'm not gonna get, get into it in detail uh, be, because I don't think it's gonna be that useful when talking about Miyazaki's work. Now, Takahara, on the other hand, who we'll get into in later episodes, might actually be a good counterpoint. He, he might be a better example of a director who doesn't really fit into this idea of uh, the auteur as we understand it. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this movie marks uh, the beginning of a lot of stuff, not just Studio Ghibli, not just uh, Miyazaki's uh, uh, feature film uh, directorial efforts, but it also marks the beginning of um, the recognizable Miyazaki style and, uh, and signature. Um, and 
the beginning of the animation studio uh, working to create some of the most gorgeous animation in anime history. Yeah, as well as various other works that have nothing to do with Miyazaki, right? It's, it's like uh, he's been a huge in, uh, influence to other works that have nothing to do with Ghibli or even Miyazaki himself, but still you know, are very inspired by his work. Yeah, yeah, and not only in Japan, but uh, in the West as well. Uh, many uh, Western animators from uh, uh, Disney and Pixar are really uh, directly inspired. Uh, they, they've said so, uh, at least, uh, by Miyazaki and his work. And, and this gets back into the, this way that this conception that this man is an unrivaled genius, he's the auteur, it does have like a positive effect because it legitimizes um in the eyes of uh, of uh, critics and contemporaries alike, uh, th these films as as works of art worthy of study and not just a commercial media. Uh, I would I would like to dispute a couple of points here because I don't think Miyazaki is actually the first thought to an anime. As you could say Osamu Tezuka because he literally created the genre, the entire medium. But there's also Yoshiyuki Tomino, who I think is a great auteur of the time, who already had a lot of his great works done by the time Miyazaki came onto the map. But really, Miyazaki is the more important one in the West, because Tomino, he does mecha anime. He's a very Japanese guy, and his stuff is very depressing, very grim, dark war dramas, while Miyazaki has a much more accessible, much more bright aesthetics. And and you're definitely right about that. That Miyazaki isn't the first uh, great director of anime, but uh, that's also the reason why I compared uh, our understanding of him to um, the origins of auteur theory. Because of course there were big great directors. Um, bef uh, yeah, that's my point actually. Because the there's other great directors, but Tomino is also an auteur. All his works will be very grim, dark, dabbling in war drama. They will always have a tortured child protagonist who is thrown into a disaster. All of his works are like that. He has a very strong audio sense and his stuff isn't easy to follow because of that. Because other directors before Miyazaki were great and before Tomino are great and most directors are better than Tomino. <laughs> is not a great uh, yeah, yeah, a um, cultural the... understanding of the auteur uh, Miyazaki is a very strong case because we really associate a strong personality with him and he's yes, exactly. very well known on an international level yeah. basically popularizing anime in the west in the first place right yeah exactly and I mean he's one of the two most important people in popularizing anime I think the other one would be either Shinichiro Watanabe or Hideaki yeah. Anno and both of those came way later just for studio ja to the guy next or for yeah, and, uh, and, and it's so. exactly this uh, th this idea of uh, of Miyazaki that that got really big in the same way that uh, the idea of uh, Alfred Hitchcock got really uh, big uh, after uh, Shona Godard's essays uh, on this idea of the auteur uh, because uh, just like in early cinema of uh, of course there've been uh, great directors who we now also would consider auteurs but um but but this uh this legitimization this uh, popularization of the idea this uh, archetype uh that's what we get uh, from Miyazaki uh, especially from our vantage point yeah, in the nobody West. would want to legitimize whatever Tomino is doing killing off his his entire cast because <laughs> he's depressed <laughs> i'm depressed i'm going to kill all my characters <laughs> <laughs> he did that he yes. did stuff like that multiple Literally. times. Yeah. <laughs> like Tomino is really, he's really uh, troubled. I don't know. I kind of like Tomino for that. His weird style makes it kind of enduring. Let's let's talk a little bit about where Miyazaki and Takahata came from before they started uh, working on Nausicaa and Studio Ghibli, because both of them have a career that is uh, longer and more deeply involved into anime, even the last. The, the couple of decades before the 80s when Nausicaa obviously was made. Nausicaa was released in the year 1984. And even before that, Miyazaki had already directed a couple of TV episodes for series like Lupin the Third, and he completely directed Mirai Shonen and Conan, Future Boy Conan. And his first feature film was uh, Lupin the Third, Castle of Cagliostro. It's also a very interesting film. I was thinking we might go into uh, 
the pre-Ghibli work at a later date once we've managed to get through the legacy of Ghibli itself. But for now, let's suffice it to say that these two people have been working together for quite a while. Even uh, Miyazaki as an animator on uh, uh, Takahata's first film, the the Oh Horus Prince of the Sun, or the Little North Prince Horus. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. And now we we encounter them again, starting their own little studio. And we can see their real Ghibli starting point here in well, Norsica. We will have to talk about Future by Conan because it has similar theming, as it's also a post apocalyptic story. But uh in my opinion much worse executed one. We will yeah, there's to, actually a lot of have... elements of Conan that I feel come back around to Nausicaa. And if you watch both, you get a real good understanding of it's uh, like a follow-up of ideas. Almost like yeah. there was some leftover stuff that Miyazaki wanted to go over, so he just made Nausicaa. Yeah, he will also improve them in later movies, like in the Castle in the Sky, where he basically recreates the same pair of characters. Just to add to the context, Nausicaa, of course, is based off of a manga that uh, Miyazaki himself created at the time of the release of the movie the manga wasn't finished yet so the movie deviates quite a bit from the from the plot of the manga and Miyazaki himself expressed some some dissatisfaction basically with some of the elements at which the movie went because after the fact his manga took some very different directions but in this podcast we are gonna occasionally mention comparisons to the manga, but uh, we're gonna stick mainly with an anal analysis of the film and mention the manga only in so far as it helps us understand the film. Miyazaki, of course, is very known for a couple of trademarks. Platon, you mentioned a couple of the uh, themes, of course, themes of him. But another idea Miyazaki is very concerned with is, of course, his animation. Yes. And I think... Daconius, you have something to say about animation. Well, a few things, because, of course, Miyazaki is known for correcting every animation cut in his movies himself, which is why a lot of them take a long time to do, because if you're correcting 100,000 cells and the guys have to completely redraw them, that is going to take time. But he also has amazing talent on this film, like Yoshinori Kanada, who is known for basically revolutionizing air. Airborne and space animation. He is the man who created the realistic, or quotation marks, realistic space flight in shows like Space Battleship Yamato. And he just comes, he is just so great in this movie. Like almost every flying scene, with, like when the big Tolmekian ship lands in the valley, and there's great 3D shots of Nazca's face and the camera. How do you call it? Going pans in, around? Going in a circle around her. What's that? Pans, yeah. It pans around her. He does so many great shots like that. You can just go into Sakugaburu and put in Canada and Norska and you will find amazing shots. I remember distinctly um, what stood out to me, remember a shot where um, the the almost chasing Nausicaa when he was on his on her like wind thing and there was like uh, blocks and stuff and like well, debris basically uh, tumbling all around her and she kind of fucking you know evaded all of them and the shot looked really great another animator we have to mention is Hideaki Anno who did the God Soldier at the end of the movie oh did he? which is probably yeah he did the entire animation of that oh, that's, that's so probably cool. the most intensive thing in the entire movie where the where the burning flesh just keeps dripping off him and everything about this god soldier is moving and it's quite a nightmarish creature. Yeah, we also get the, uh, whatever the effect is called, it should have a specific name where it's like the laser beam draws a line and then suddenly there's a delayed explosion of it. It's a very Anno touch. and uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very, very common trick yeah, and it's it, so it works every time. It's basically the... It's basically the whole idea of, of uh, ten tension build-up and release, uh, right? Yes. I think this entire gig inspired Anno in a great way, because this god soldier is quite similar to the angels in his later work Evangelion. And I think even his space monsters in Gunbuster are quite reminiscent of the insects in Nazca. 
think he took a lot from his time with Miyazaki, and of course he's a great friend of Miyazaki. So I think Anno's career was very positively impacted by working on this movie. Not only that he did so did these great cuts that got him into the industry, although he got him, himself into the industry with his own studio, with his own homegrown studio thingy. Because Gainax, as we know, is very, very abnormal for for an anime studio. Yeah, that is true. Could it be that he was also inspired, maybe, by um, uh, maybe being around this new group that kind of went on on his own way? Because we knew that um, Miyazaki was going to start his new studio right after. Maybe that this um, enthusiastic energy kind of went over to Anno to create his own thing. I think Gainax and Ghibli were founded in the same year, so yeah. there might be a, a comparable energy in there. One thing I would like to say about the movie, it doesn't really look like other movies of the time. If you compare it to something like Crusher Joe or Technopolis 21C, which is an earlier work by the guys who would do Macross, has a lot of the same stuff. They are animated differently, and especially the backgrounds, because Nosca has these painted backgrounds, where it lo looks a bit like manga, and a lot of stuff is animated as if it were a manga cutout, a colored manga cutout. A lot of the airships, like the Tomekin airships with all their detail, they're basically manga cutouts moving. And also the Ohm in the beginning of the movie. It feels like it's like 10 slices of manga which are being moved. Which is quite atypical, because in something like Technopolis 21C, the background is drawn in the same way as the foreground, the same way the characters are drawn, in the same way the mecha are drawn. It creates a very weird aesthetic that is in a lot of 80s stuff, where there is no separation. And I think these movies helped put themselves apart from the other animation of the time, and this would become the standard later. When you didn't really have the money to animate everything the same way. And then we had worse backgrounds. But that's the story for another day. <laughs> well, that, what also stood out for me in the in animation part. That the action scenes were animated in like. Felt way slower to me at least. Like how every action uh, like played out. For instance when Nausicaa and uh, S Bell, what's his name? Aspel. Yeah, Aspel, Aspel of Pegeta. When, yeah, when they were chased by the giant flying dragonfly insect, it it played out like really slow. You, you could, it was almost slow motion when when they if I invaded their fangs. Like that that seemed very atypical to me, and compared to like other action portions of other shows. I don't know. Well, I think back then that was more common. Like Mobile Suit Gundam had a lot of animation cuts that were slowed down, and it was often an effect to slow it down to draw it with slower frame rate to imply speed by doing the opposite, which is a very weird limited animation technique. But this one is obviously much more fluent. It's also a very yeah. common uh, limited animation technique essay where many of them were pioneered by o Osamu Dezaki, basically. And in Ashito no Joe, uh, he also heavily uses the effect of slowing down very intense and fast motions with flashing images even usually to uh, bring home the impact. Limited animation is a really interesting and important technique for anime of this kind. So it's interesting that you yeah. make the connection here. Yeah, it's fascinating. Tezuka and Dezaki are the people who really brought that because Tezuka needed to build a studio at all to make it profitable at all because NHK didn't want to give him any money for his animation projects. So he made them so cheap and that overworked his people so hard that he could somehow do it. <laughs> so, so, so the most... Osamu... Please go on. Tezuka, because Tezuka created it, but Dezaki used it, he developed it, he made a Dezaki triple, he made his own Dezaki impact frames, like there's a lot from Dezaki, which you barely see in Ghibli movies because they don't need as much limited animation, but he is a big, a big influence, we should have to say. 
So I was about to say what what interested me the most and I think is most important about the animation in this film is, is two things specifically. We already touched on the, the ohm a lot and we talked a bit about the flying machines. The ohm, of course, I think it's really interesting how the painted layers, as you described it, create a really unnatural and unnerving sort of movement in a way that is really fascinating, unsettling. They're almost like moving mountains because they also have the texture of yeah, mountains, they're... right? An otherworldly creature. Yeah, the very definition of an otherworldly creature. Giant moving mountain. But what I think is interesting about that is the way that like they're clearly like alien from the outside. The 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 shifting blocks, almost mechanical like, but then we have the uh the weird light tentacle things they produce and that's like their uh their inner peaceful self and those are only shown to Narsica because of her connection with them. So it's like the dichotomy of how everyone views the ohm on the outside to how they actually are and what they are doing for this world, which comes back around in the plot, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a re really interesting example of um, of using uh, uh, design to uh, enhance the story rather than just as a, as a dressing for the story. Yeah, it's like a cool thing on the side. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's it's integral to uh, the design of the of the omu uh, is integral to uh, our understanding of the omu of uh, the way we feel unsettled by them, uh, and the the surprise uh, we 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 feel at least first time watching it when when we understand that they have this uh, this soulfulness to them this this inner uh, this inner depth. I mean, the sound design works into this as well, right? Because that's something that was that stood out to me as distinct as well. That, uh, like, the way it the insects move, I come back to this dragonfly insect. It was like, oh, it's almost indescribable. The sound, it's like, um, like this weird rattling sound of me like metallic rattling sound. The one when their like body parts are like moving over each other. This. It's like super alien, just to make it sound as alien as possible. Um, which also kind of feeds into like the sci-fi thing, which we're going to talk about later. The very first um, almost appearance, its otherworldliness is also very much amplified by the genius soundtrack work, where the, where the Omo track plays that Joe Hisaishi composed, where it's just those gongs, those disconnected oh, gongs, yeah. which introduce the Omu because this is Hisaishi's first big work and his first work with Miyazaki and you can tell that because this uses the sounds that are more 80s I think than his other works he uses stuff that he wouldn't use later because later he's just full on symphonic philharmonic soundtracks and here mm -hmm. we have weird electrical noises I could, you could say doesn't yeah, this even... film sounded like an early Yes album. <laughs> yeah, and you could also say that um, that the, the, these um, the, the the sort of more uh, more electronic uh, soundtrack uh, f fits here where it wouldn't fit with uh, with later Ghibli films because it, later Ghibli films were much more fantasy. While well, this is, well, well, what would you say it is, uh, Dark? I mean, the general classification of this is a biopunk science fiction because it's very much a punk, like steampunk, but it's very biological based with the Omu, with the God Soldier, and it's a very post apocalyptic story. And the manga goes more into this with, with the people who live in the forest, in the Sea of Decay, which are not in the movie at all, for example. Also in the Dorok. In the Empire that doesn't appear in the movie at all. I think that bi biopunk science fiction is the best label we could put on this, I, or the genre of sci-fi. I'm particularly fascinated by the term biopunk because I can't immediately think of other biopunk works, but I've certainly stumbled across a term before, because basically where if steampunk is a fusion of, let's say, early industrial uh, industrial revolution aesthetics with uh, well, sci-fi sensibilities, century. late 19th century, and I've also heard diesel punk, which basically appropriates the aesthetics of the, of the 20s, but uh, biopunk then would be, in this sense at least, a return to more a natural community, to rural life in this sense. It's a is it though? It's also more of 
biotechnology yeah, kind of base. That's right. right. The God so Warriors that's... themselves are bioengineered beings or organisms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's so, um uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, the Hydra are also such a creature, but again only in the manga. The Hydra are, are things they are soldiers created before the god soldiers destroyed the earth. They are a remnant of the old civilization. Also genetically engineered for meter human monsters. Well, I've, uh, I've, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with the idea that this is uh, science fiction because it, I, I associate like this story a lot more with ideas of fantasy. Uh, we, we have a, we have a, a, a princess uh, of uh, a, a, a lot of proper names, a lot of. Uh, she, she's essentially like almost a prophesized uh, chosen one savior of, 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 and it's about a fight between different uh, different races. In this case, not elves and men, but giant mountainous bug monsters and men. Um, uh, and and it's got a lot of um, f fantasy stuff, like like with um, the cho their choice of weapons is often uh, swords and blades, um, where the uh the intruders the empire they're more uh in industrial they're they're more uh science fictionish uh so, so right. I, I think it's more of a, a a strange hybrid it is certainly a strange hybrid if we're talking about the aesthetic of the genre and this is honestly a deep cut into the question of what even is science fiction in the first place and in in this lens i would completely argue that it is science fiction but um, in an academic context, let's say we define science fiction more as, and as, this is as Darko Souvent puts, puts it, that sci-fi is the literature of cognitive estrangement. So to explain this terminology a little bit, it is less about the aesthetics of space and, and, and future technology, like for example, Star Wars, which is something we would intuitively consider sci-fi, but it honestly doesn't fit with the more academic criteria because after in the end if we think about it the technology is just a proxy uh, for for things we could explain without any um, um, element of cognitive estrangement it's just basically fantasy with the aesthetics of future meanwhile science fiction as argued uh, from from Souvent is um, something that intentionally challenges you to reflect on something that is happening in, in the current reality. Let's say, for example, in Nausicaa, we can observe environmental crisis. We can think about them. What are we doing? We observe humans' interactions with nature. And Nausicaa takes this idea and estranges it. It puts it into a future context in which the env environmental collapse already happened, where toxic poisonous jungles covered the earth as a consequence of humans warfare and irrational destruction and exploitation of the earth so in this sense suwon would certainly say that nausicaa is, is pure pure sci-fi because the point of it is to take the idea of um uh, environmental collapse through human technology and put it into a kind of believable future even it is something that is supposed to mirror our reality and question it and critically uh, challenge the ideas that we operate under that made this possible. And this is a very core idea to uh, any conception of sci-fi, as Savant puts it. Also, side note, uh, if you want a good example of biopunk, just watch the David Cronenberg film Existence, a really good example of that. Literally, like, all the technology are biological components, uh, even, like, video games. Okay, that that seems very interesting, but it goes in a, in quite a different direction from Nausicaa, right? Yeah, no, I was just noting that in because if you wanted to know what biopunk was, well, I I always thought biopunk is a name I've only heard in the in the context of Nausicaa. To be honest, I sometimes think this this name was created for this manga for this movie because it's very unique in that. In that way of approaching it, because most post-apocalyptic stories aren't going back to exactly this state of technology. They either go further back or not as far back. I think yeah, this it, middle ground is quite unique. It really is quite unique. Uh, it, it is, but uh, but there's at the same time there are elements that are very recognizable. For for instance, we mentioned a uh, steampunk uh, and and diesel punk earlier, and and I think like. Um, 
like the the uh, the, the the crashing uh, plane, these big uh, these big chunkers uh, behemoths of, of of metal that uh, that fly through through the sky uh, that that uh, the, the empire uses. Uh, th those are definitely, I, I would say, th those are much closer to uh, to diesel punk than to anything else. I've also heard, just to add another layer to the punk discussion, I've also heard uh, Nausicaa being called a proto proto solar punk work, when solar punk basically is this very current uh, direction of science fiction which has an optimistic and synergistic vision of living in small communities or in communities in synergy with nature using solar energy wind energy and basically the picture of a green very rural city and a overgrown cityscape needs to come to mind here as basically an abandonment of urban gray landscapes in favor of green and more open areas yeah i so, can see that and uh, and at the same time the the, the technology they are using is uh is specifically synergistic like we um the flying machine uh that Nausicaa is using this uh, this glider uh is very clearly uh, futuristic but but also uh some somewhat clean and in sync with uh with the winds and uh, and with nature in a way that uh, the big uh, hulking uh, gas guzzlers yeah, of the sky comes off uh, of the bad guys <laughs> really aren't. clearly in the film where like the um the small glider for Nausicaa is like incredibly light uh, they're very small and compact it's almost like a pair of wings that she just has and can go anywhere she can take off from literally just the flat ground and so it's a complete yeah it's a complete it's a symbol of complete well, freedom angel, of course she has and then wings. you have the uh, the biggish warships they kind of look like the ones from Conan. I think that was a clear carryover design-wise. And they're just these hulking things that can like barely be steered. And one, in fact, towards the beginning is literally crashed into the valley because it can't even steer properly. It's, it's a bastardization of Miyazaki's love for flying, where it's like, this is, this is how you fly wrong. This is the industrialized bad version of it. Exactly, no and that's that, that's a really interesting element of um, that's a really interesting element of uh, Miyazaki's uh, love for flying, which uh, he, he himself has said that uh, that for him, uh, flying means freedom, which is uh, I mean, let's not necessarily take his word for it, but but it's a pretty good reading um, that uh, th that f uh, flight uh, is uh, is so something that you do that you can only do when when you're free, and that. Uh, allows you to be free but at the same time it's here it's also used as a symbol of, of control of power of uh, with these giant uh, ships that basically um, force themselves into the sky in a way um, yeah it's almost like they're flying yeah. against nature instead of being carried with nature like yeah. the glider that that yeah Nausicaa's exactly using. that was what i was trying to say because um kind of the glider of Nausicaa is kind of reliant on the wind in order to fly, whereas, like, those big hulking monstrosities of flying machines are kind of fly against the wind. And They're it, using also... As you could see, when, when it fl flew into the valley, the, it was the wind itself that brought them down, so... They are also um, using fire, yeah. right? The, the big airships are all driven by yeah. engines. They consume... Fire is something in this movie that is associated with, with destruction, with consuming of nature, with reduction to ashes, right? And then this pushing against nature uh, is really also symbolized through the act that it is driven by fire. And I mean, all of these machines are spitting such huge smoke clouds and you see uh, when they burn down, it's a really impactful image. The first time we see the huge, uh, huge uh, steel airship if is when we see it burning and crashing right exactly and uh, and it, it it gets to uh the core uh fantasy of flight in um in miyazaki's work which is um that th th there would be a sort of contradiction with his love of flight and his environmentalism because uh flying machines consume a lot of fuel like like it's it's not uh it, it's not a simple joy it, it can't be but in in these fantastical in uh these, this post-apocalypse uh, with with flying dragons with uh, spirits you can you can with animation you can take flight uh, 
in a clean and easy way. Um, but but there is really this uh, this core contradiction in his love of flying that I think he only really um, uh, seriously uh, looks at uh, in his uh, final work, or it seems to be his second to final work. I think he's working on a new film, but uh, The Wind Rises, um, which yeah, we'll get to in a long time. I think this exposes yeah, something time. about Miyazaki because he always says he doesn't like the otaku and he doesn't want them to consume his... No, that I don't think he ever said he doesn't want them to consume his work. But really, he is an otaku. He's a mechanical otaku, not only for flying machines, but the flying machines are obviously such a thing because he may hate giant flying devices in real life, but he's fascinated by them. He loves them, really. And you can also see that that he that the tanks he's drawing in this movie, I think they're very close to German World War Two tanks, and you will also see him later in his manga, like Tigers in the Mud and Hans Return. He will come back to that, where he will actually set color watercolor to the German side of the World War, to German tank commanders, because he's fascinated by mechanics and by tanks and by flying machines. Because he loves that stuff. Yeah, that's he may not want to admit it. Um, I mean, he's also a guy with a waifu, even if he doesn't want to admit it. His story with the Hakuchaden <laughs> girl. <laughs> well, that's very interesting because, if, yeah, he, he, he could talk, he, if he talks about Otaku, of course, there's very different meanings of Otaku, what very different people believe. If you believe, I think the most popular co conception of the word really is someone who consumes his hobby inside his own house and doesn't really have hobbies outside of the house which is i mean it's a very descriptive term but it doesn't really get to the the social um meaning of it and how it's used yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll get deeper into uh otaku and otaku culture in terms of studio ghibli uh, later on in the in, in this podcast series um, i mean of course yeah I'll, I'll i'll keep it brief this time but how some people will describe otaku, I think Miyazaki might agree with this, is um, as a person that looks to media to escape his own life and also uh, is very invested in material culture and material consumption, which is an other aspect that uh, otaku culture sometimes seems to kind of uh, aim towards. If you think about Akihabara and the consum material consumption culture and exactly, uh, yeah. media, like if you look at modern media, modern uh, harem shows, for instance, as a pure escapist fantasy instead of a uh, core work of fantasy, which I think Miyazaki is very interested in. Yeah, and exactly latter. this uh, this dislike of consumption uh, really ties itself uh, into his environmentalism and uh it, it ties itself into this uh this this film's uh, contrast between uh, the valley of the wind uh and, and and the empire that we have this um the the valley isn't a consumer uh culture they're they're uh, agriculturalists they're uh, in a way uh hunter gatherers the, the first thing we see uh Nausicaa do is go, go around uh, s uh, salvaging, gathering uh, things for uh, her people, uh, and uh, it, and it's uh, what, what was it they they said uh, in the film? We, we like the water and the wind. They don't like the fire. And that that's that's a really uh, a really good way of setting up this contrast. Yeah, uh, that's in the film. true. But there's also. Um... There, I don't think it's a pure dichotomy between technology and nature or agriculturalism because uh, the Valley of the Rin really does use technology, not only in the glider, but in the way they get their water out of the air. If you look closely at like the mechanical design of like these windmills and them pumping on water and um, the various other tools that the villagers use, they're not very primitive if you really... Uh, pay it, pay close attention. So I don't 
they're certainly pre-industrial in yeah. that they don't use fire and, yeah, pre and are yeah, destructive. They're not, they're not mass produced, but they're not untechnology. No, well, not, they're both pre and post-industrial, I would say. Yeah, but industrial is different from using technology. Yeah, but what I'm saying. a lot of their technology is yeah. very advanced, but they exactly. only have it's, it as a remnant. They only know parts of it. They only remember parts of the ceramic era, as it's called in the manga. The time right before the f seven days of fire, because ceramic blades are very high technology, to be honest, and they are very great. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 salvaging. It's recycling. Yes. It's not uh, it's not consuming. It's not burning. Yeah, but I think the real distinction between them is the um, the Valley of the Wind is not just industrial, but it's also not like expansionist or like warmongering or just even trying to be big like all the other empires we see in this film and also the manga like i think a good example of this is the um the small gunship that the the it's valley the, it's has the x-wing because it's a weapon it's kind of an industrial like plane that like can bring down other ones but it's purely like a defensive thing they could never invade anyone with this gunship it's purely like a, a libertarian holding his ar-15 you know it's it's only for his <laughs> own defense yeah well, the, uh, the small and it's gunship very represents. interesting I what mean, you say about that they aren't expansionist. It is the because Valley of the Wind work. itself seems to understand itself as a very as a uh, as a niche ecosystem in itself. They know where the world of the Omis and the world of the insect, like Nausicaa, repeatedly says, "This is not your world. Return to the jungle." And they know which their world is. They know that the trees, the forest has protected them, that the valley has protected them. They know that this is their living space. While the Sea of Decay in this case is actually expansionist, but the Valley of the Wind just goes with it and has found their place to be. And they have no desire to reclaim it or to attack it. They just kind of found a peaceful little place within the apocalypse for themselves. Which I found very interesting. Yeah, they are pacifists in like the true, the most true sense of the word. Need not only being pacifists of being peaceful, but also of being passive, yeah, in the way uh, of not oh, being sorry, active. I found the, I found the opening scene really fascinating, where we see Nausicaa exploring the toxic jungle, where she runs around being careful, she's very curious, she's observant, she's looking at all these spores, she's collecting a spore to research later, then she finds the the, the, the shell of an ohm, and the first thing she does is she says, wow, our, our village can use this, we will, have, we will not have to worry about making tools for a month or so now. And then one of the most remarkable scenes happens where she, where she grabs the, the empty shell of an eye of an ohm, and sets, sits down under the lens of the ohm and looks through it and enjoys the spores just snowing down on her. Literally a perspective shift. She sees the thing through the eye of an ohm. She's very careful and observant and yeah, exactly, really yeah. Yeah, compassionate it's, um, with it, all it, of her peaceful. surroundings. It's really interesting. Yeah, also in the opening of the film, like within the first 15 minutes, she steps on a bug but then apologizes to it kindly. She tames the teto, the wild animal, and she also puts like her head directly in the jaws of uh, the big bird things, showing how much she trusts it, and then also completely calms down the arm, which just leads into like the first fifteen minutes completely clarifying what like an uh, a nature loving person Nasca yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it, it, it's something really fascinating because we've talked about this being post apocalypse science fiction and stuff, but it's not at all the type of post apocalypse that uh, that we'd be used to. Uh is uh, and and as you you say, uh, Nyad, in the very first scene, we we understand that that sh she's found like like so, some some sort of peace. It's a uh, it's it's kind of a fun place for for her to be. And we have the, this people of the valley who have learned to uh, to live on and uh, and live uh, in a, in a more uh, synergistic way uh, along with nature. Um, it's it, it's a peaceful post apocalypse where the world. That there was there was a huge war. There was uh, humanity fucked everything up, but 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 it's fine. We, we we'll be fine eventually, and we'll 
um, and we'll we'll find a way to uh, to live on. And I think this this conception of the uh, apocalypse is uh, is really distinctly non-Western. Um, uh, and I believe that it has to do with uh, some of the deeper philosophical roots um, uh, of uh, Japanese uh, culture in contrast with uh, with the West. Um, the dominant religion in uh, in Japan is uh, Shintoism, um, which uh, central to to the belief system of Shintoism is the idea of kami, which is often translated to spirits or essences. Essentially, uh, all, all things have this this kami, this essence, this uh, individual mini godhood, from uh, from rocks to trees to forests to people to uh, yeah to <laughs> yeah and so on and so forth. Um, w- which means that that um, that everything has some sort of uh, soul uh, in a way. Um, and 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 we have to consider them uh, as ha- as having this sort of uh, degree of agency, whereas in uh, in Western uh, the Western conception of nature uh, we have the from the Abrahamic religions God created us in His image and the world and the animals for us to. Um, to to use to use responsibly of course but but they're, they're for us to use so in a western ap- apocalypse where uh, when nature takes over it becomes uh, a, a world of scarcity of resources not being available and for desperate fight to survive and have those resources where uh, where in the, in this uh, instance and in uh, in in other instances so, such as uh, uh, Yokohama's shopping log, and uh, and later as we'll see, uh, Laputa Castle in the Sky. Um, the post-apocalypse is is sort of just a new natural state of things. That there's an acceptance there, uh, which I I find absolutely fascinating. Is it's a sort of tale you uh, you don't really uh, see anywhere in the West. This also, yeah, I think it's rooted in Abrahamic religions coming from the desert, basically, because they always lived in scarcity. They used what they could, while Japan was always rather lush. And most places that retained natural religions are rather lush places where life wasn't as hard as in the desert, where nomad shepherds were going around with their religion. Yeah, yeah. So, so if Japan started in a desert, we wouldn't have Nausicaa. I mean, <laughs> those really are really sad. interesting <laughs> theories, of course. Um, you have to realize at the same time that um, uh, you have to be careful about these things because it's really easy to just insert your own biases into these kinds of theories and just uh, go on and speculate and speculate and speculate. Um, uh, but yeah, they, it is very interesting. What I would like to add as well is that um, not only Shinto, um, characterizing Shinto as the main religion of Japan is a bit, I think well, Japan nas- Japanese nationalists would really agree with you on that, but I'm not so sure myself. Um, uh, as, as I understand it, it's um, it, it's it, they live in a very secular society, but... but uh, Sh- Sh- Shinto is is still like a part of their culture, the same way uh, uh, Christianity is is a part of yeah, the Scandinavian yeah, of culture, I, even I if a, a lot of us are atheists. Um, but it would be um, an under it would be not very accurate to ignore the Buddhist influences as well, because uh, Buddhism has been around since around the year 300 400 some somewhere in japan when it came from korea and it has been just as if not more influential um in the whole conception of nature and uh being uh but i think we're gonna talk about this in in yeah of course Uh, it's just a minor correction of course i still think that the that the theory describing these uh differences in like religious worldview is very accurate. Um, what what struck me as well is that um, the conception of nature in in Buddhism as well as Shintoism is very is much more decentralized 
in the sense that um, there is a Lord, as we say, in a Lord in Western or Abrahamic tradition is is one that that is central and above all. Whereas in in uh, in those other religions, it's more something that is in everything, is decentralized, is um, no one the one tree doesn't have authority over another tree. For instance, one mountain, even though it's bigger, doesn't have authority over another mountain. In 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 Abrahamic tradition, it's more like God has authority over everything, and it gave us authority to have authority over nature. Well, what about Mount Fuji? That's the question, because Mount Fuji has some authority over Japan, as I understand it. But I do agree that Japan, Japan has this very spiritual Buddhist side and the more mystical Shinto side because they were always were always they are both religions and they mixed you could say there's they are a synergy because a lot of the worldview is Buddhist while a lot of the mysticism is Shintoist. I think that's very Sounds essential to the Japanese understanding of spirituality. Something that also ties into this and very neatly fits into what Platon was talking about with the peaceful apocalypse is the idea of mono no avare, which is an aesthetic idea in, in some Japanese art, and mono no avare translates to something like the pathos of things or an empathy towards things. It is an aesthetics that is very concerned with impermanence, with ephemerality, with the passing on of things. Basically, it is like a deep, transient, gentle sadness when confronted with things that might pass. And as shocking as this idea might sound to our worldview, very anthropocentric, yeah, very... depressing. What are you, what are you yes. talking about? The thing is, it is something that is... This idea is something that gives peace, something that will fade, it will all return to yeah. nothing, basically. We'll all return one. That is a Buddhist it thing. It actually reminds me of the lecture exactly. on Heidegger I, just, I saw yesterday. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'll let you go into this uh, shortly, but sorry. for now, um, I think it's very interesting how Nausicaa it is applied to all of humanity, in a sense. The Valley of the Wind have kind of accepted humanity's impermanence. Like, when we look at our current civilization, we always are concerned when we're faced with environmental issues, the end of humanity, which, is, which could happen with the end of civilization as we know it, and we are scared and concerned with it. And, of course, it's a very extremely scary prospect but in Nausicaa you see basically the idea this ties into the idea of the peaceful apocalypse you see a humanity that has already ended in so far that they are now only living in small communities or kingdoms spread among the uh, toxic jungle and are fighting for their survival or not in terms of the valley of the wind as we talked about earlier they seem to have accepted their niche they seem not to be so worried about the idea of impermanence as the other empires are which are very concerned about reclaiming ground and attacking the forest and burning it down, right? While Nausicaa instead is someone who goes into the forest and empathizes with all the creatures and recognizes them as as almost as they are supposed to be there, they are allowed to be there, they are to be lived with, to be synergized with. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that's uh, and that empathy that. Uh... That that understanding of the impermanence, which uh, the the image we talked about earlier of her just sitting there watching the the spore snow falling is is really that, what you're talking about that that mono no aware that this this moment is, is fleeting uh, sensation that's that's really um, so something I I find uh, is really special about anime. Um, I think that's also highly relevant in the. Uh... The sea of corruption, like the uh, whatever the sand plane underneath it is, where it's like everything on the surface is pretty fucked. Uh, toxic gas everywhere. It's killing all the humans, all the living things other than insects. But like, it's almost the cycle of nature itself, where like everything gets filtered down. Uh, the water becomes clean, and the earth is just going to kind of slowly reset itself. So even though humans will die out and other animals will die out, like nature as a whole will just continue on turning. And it's almost yeah, it's like that idea. Miyazaki's is, beliefs uh, turned into a sci fi concept. Uh, high speed carbon. Yeah, yeah. Not carbon cycle, high speed carbonation. Like when cold is created, it's the same thing, but much faster. It's basically the same thing. I think the entire forest is his beliefs. Yeah. 
the, indeed, it's very fascinating. Um, this Monono Aware, the 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 decay of things. Uh, no, not as, the decay, it's maybe... the impermanence, impermanence of things. Yeah, I, it's true, but um, uh, the impermanence, which kind of feeds into, but I kind of want to attack it as an, an a Japanese essentialism because I would kind of regret falling into some Oriental uh, ways of speaking here, <laughs> because um, so I wanted to maybe uh, give more of a Western example of. Uh, of mono no Arai as well, which is uh, coincidentally, I watched this uh, this lecture on on Heidegger yesterday from Rick Roderick. It's a great lecture series, Attack on the Self, no, the Self under Siege. Um, basically, for Heidegger, the the first um, fact of existence was uh, my existence will end one day, and he conceptualized that as uh, the thing everything flows from. So in a way, that is very similar to Mono no Awari. So yes, it's, uh, it, Mono no Awari was something that was very, uh, very present, especially in Heian poetry, Heian literature. And um, it has a lot of ex existentialist themes as well. If if you want to ba go back to uh, thinkers from the sixties, um, so Wait, yeah. I mean, so, so, one could, uh, so so one could say that uh, Mono no Aure, it's um, it, it it's a very influential aesthetic in, in Japanese yes. uh, cultural history, but it's not an essentially Japanese yes, idea. Exactly. Uh, they're not the only ones who figured out that uh, things will end one day, and there's some peace to be found in that. Well, yeah, how I would conceptualize that is that, um, not conceptualize, but say it, is that, uh, yeah, it, it, it is a very influential idea in Japanese um, art, especially Heian era art. And it is very possible that Miyazaki took this as a reference or as a uh, thing to go from. But it is indeed a mistake to construct it as some sort of unique uh uniquely Japanese vision of reality. Yeah, I'm sure we'll yes. get more into uh, th this uh, concept when we get to his more uh, quiet, uh, calm works like uh, My Neighbor Totoro and uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. And especially once we reach Only Yesterday by Takahara. Oh yeah, definitely. I think the figure of Nausicaa, her origins are also connected with this because as he said, his main inspirations by the girl she is named after, the princess Naushika of the Odyssey, and Heian, in Heian period, princess, which I can't find the name of, which was kind of a re rebellious figure, a strong female figure in the Heian period. She refused to paint her teeth black, which was a tradition in Japan until very recently, actually. I think yeah, yeah. the entire... She's, um... entire figure is a Heian period person. Yeah, so, so, so she is sort of uh, th this fusion of cl uh, of uh, classical uh, uh, Greek, that that is a, what we consider classical Western uh, c uh, characters and classical Japanese characters. Uh, and, and, th th this, uh, and this sort of gets us into uh, the, the idea of Nausicaa herself as a character. Uh, th this um, her f how her femininity fits into uh, the story. Uh, one could argue that 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 exactly her f uh, femininity is um, is manifested in her empathy, which is her uh, great power. Where all all the men are more uh, m more brash, more uh, uh, le less empathic, uh, and thus uh, th they aren't the heroes. Yeah, I was thinking that's like a for me at least that seems to be one of the very key themes of the of the film, if not just the way all the characters are presented. Where Nasca is uh, both like a warrior and also a mother figure, and admittedly that's far more true in the manga. But even in this, she's still seen as like incredibly caring, uh, even yeah, like apologizing to like even the smallest of animals and insects. She's just bursting with compassion and always trying to find 
a peaceful solution throughout things, but all the men in the film are distinctly like violent and direct and um believing there's only like a zero sum game to everything because like even master Yupa or Lord Yupa he's like a he's on our side, but he's still like this killing machine who only his only device in the plot is just uh hurting people in order to uh, to achieve kind of a an end goal for or... And then we see if I may like, interrupt you, but I um, think one of the most prominent scenes with Master Yupa was when he was jumping in between, st- literally stopping Nausicaa's blade with his arm and saying, "Let's not let this escalate in violence and rage because Nausicaa was losing her 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 composure oh, yeah. and was a- attacking after he she saw that her fa- father was killed." And Yupa jumped yeah, in between. I was thinking of that too, but he's also holding a knife yes, to the but... other guy's neck. So there's still that permanent like level. But in a sense, I wouldn't call him as the complexity. single agent of violence, but instead as a mediator between violence and 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 peace in a sense, because he stops to negotiate to reason, right? Yeah, that's true. But being a bu- being a good guy, he obviously is trying to find the best solution. But I still feel like his only real function in in the plot, as we see, is continuing through violence, particularly where uh, there's a real great scene in the film that I really feel. Uh, exemplifies all of this in which they're invading the uh Pegite ship the uh don docks and they're like uh ra- trying to ram the door down and on the, on the other side of the door we see the dundalk leader who's a male and all the dundalk no the Pegites, they're all male the leaders are and they're like he's saying we'll die with honor and dignity instead of giving in to them and he's literally like holding a stick of dynamite like four inches from a baby's face and he's saying we're all gonna go you know, we'd rather die like this than we will. And like having all these crying women and children around him is a great, almost like peak toxic masculinity right there. Instead of giving up, they will just uh, decide to go with this outrageously violent option. And then, of course, Master Yupa comes in and wipes out everyone instantly because he's just a badass like that. Yeah, he he is a badass like that. I, 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 you could say that Ma- Ma- Master Yupa, while uh, he he's not like. Uh, an essentially violent uh, f- figure. He does see the the he he does see reason in saying, "Hey, okay, let's let's capitulate for now. Let's not sacrifice ourselves." But at the same time, he's definitely not a pacifist. Where uh, Nausicaa is very much uh, a, a pacifist, uh, at least uh, after she loses her cool that once. I think he is very very molded by. His world. I think he is what Miyazaki sees as the male figure that has arranged himself with the world that is probably the best a person can be in this world without looking past this world, where you, where he can't escape it. He doesn't have the power of Nausicaa. He can't revolutionize the world. That is very interesting. Yeah, that that's a good point that's a specifically why he like remains a wanderer even in like the end credits we see it like he's he's always going off he cannot be the leader that Narsica can be that's why he helps her in the manga like he he continues to be an important figure like spying yeah. on the Dorok like he spied on the Tomekians in the film a lot of scenes that in when the film would later be recontextualized in the manga with other people especially with the Doroks, like the scene in the PGT airship would later be in the man- manga volume 4, I think, where it's the Dorok airship, where they help her escape. It's, it's a really interesting point about his character, but I, I want to get back to something you said, uh, uh, Hipster Cthulhu, which uh, you, you said that, like, uh, essentially, uh, all, all the, the, uh, the men are violent. Of, what, what, about, uh, what about Kushana? What about the this... Uh, golden armored uh leader of the the uh, invading empire but how does she fit into that theory kushana backs up this theory by being a uh, strictly like assuming a masculine role and like almost rejecting her femininity fully she tries to be like this warmongering leader she tries to be like the other men we see in the film and she's like almost directly punished for this because we find out that she's like missing an arm and she says um the a direct quote is, whoever becomes my husband will see worse than that. So that implies something like her body and almost like the feminine nature of her body has been like corrupted and like destroyed by the insects because she has assumed this violent role and putting herself in that way. 
has led to this consequence. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that uh, uh, take, uh, especially because we see a contrast between her leadership and uh, her right-hand man, who is very much more forward, uh, much uh, th- does, doesn't really th- think as far ahead as she does. Uh, she seems to be able to keep a cool head, and um, uh, and, and when he says, for example, uh, g- g- kill that old uh, w- uh, witch, g- g- kill that old uh, uh, Obasan, uh, she, she's like, no, 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 just just let her talk. Uh, I think there's, I think I, th- I think there's a there's a difference between her uh, attitude and and the masculine attitude could I, uh, in this. Could film. I give my take on this for a bit? Um, I think it's very interesting. I think about this a lot. I read about this a lot. Um, I think the Connell's uh, conceptualization of hegemonic masculinity fits in here really well. What I like about Darconius' take is how um, he kind of recognizes this. So basically to explain what what hegemonic masculinity means is that there is a form of ideal masculinity. So what Connell says is there is a myriad of different masculinities, a uh, myriad of different gender expressions uh, that men can make, but only one, uh, only a very uh, selected collection of these expressions could be seen as hegemonically masculine. So are seen in our society as um, validly masculine. And this is the only true perception of masculinity, uh, according to our common sense notions, which is um, a conceptualization by Gramsci, which uh, tackles hegemony as uh, those ideas that uh, in our society take forms, take the form of common sense notions. Um, So basically what you're saying is that there's a, form of common sense commonly understood notion of the concept masculinity that is floating around and is sort of a standard or a sort yeah, of there's, idealized there's a picture proper of uh, yes. uh, the, the idea is that the, a proper masculinity uh, that society generally has a, uh, an idea of so so yeah. I, I guess you would say that kushana conforms to the hegemonic masculinity of the world of the film yes but what i would like to add to that is that uh, what I think Miyazaki's greatest strength is is his sociological storytelling, um, which means that he views his characters through the environment they are in instead of from a sort of individual essence. Um, on that point, I don't agree with Hipster because um, he states that Kushana is, for instance, personally pu- punished for not... Uh, for participating in in this form but on the other hand we can see for instance if you are perceptive you can see that uh, her whole entire army is all men uh, her under subordinate and uh, her direct subordinate is also a man so you can it would not be a stretch to to think that um, the society where she comes from is not entirely as progressive as her position might make you believe. It might be that she is, what I think, what my perception is, is that she is uh, a very part of maybe only one of highly influential females in in her own society of uh, hyper-masculine leadership. Uh, and in order for her to uh, ascend to this position, she had, she was uh, in a way forced to exhibit the same ideology, uh, ideolo- uh, idealistic masculine traits that uh, people who have to respect her, uh, her, have to promote her to that position also exhibit and idealize. Yes, absolutely. Because I have to bring in the manga a bit. Because Kushana, as we know, is the princess of Tolmekia. She is one of the daughters of the king and she has three older brothers, which are all out to kill each other. They are always plotting who will get the throne in the end. 
and she's part of that game of that political intrigue inside the family so she's part of the game of thrones yes <laughs> and she more or less had to become this masculine figure because she would have been worse off as a woman she would have been brought into a, a monastery probably or something equivalent to that and then her story would have ended her life wouldn't have been as easy wouldn't have been as hard as it was probably but she chose to be strong to uh, participate in this society to participate in this game so she can change her world so she can change her society I so yeah that's very interesting wait can i say one more thing um so what that kind of illustrates what i was getting at earlier is that in her society as well there's a very exclusive and selected group of traits for gender in general for femininity or masculine so um in order to be masculine you have to be aggressive subjugate others be in charge um risk taking for instance these are all coded masculine traits in our society also in the Talmikian society as it turns out um and there's the dichotomy of female which is coded in our society to be more passive etc uh, etc et but what um right. yeah. nausicaa does really powerfully is it subverts these notions so it calls into question these these notions when it shows nausicaa showing traits that are more um coded masculine in how we view it or how the viewer would would see it or um and how all the men under her are they are masculine men but they are still subjugated by a woman in a way because they follow her leadership not subjugated but uh, led by a woman uh so it's, it's very clear that with nausicaa they all uh completely inspired by her and like they yeah. are following her completely willingly yeah, they want but their it... children to grow up to be like her yeah yeah nausicaa exactly. is just loved by everyone all the time but even kushana herself challenges the notion of yeah. a passive woman we you get a very clear depiction of a woman who is who owns violence basically she she is a very active agent of violence so we don't get a wishy-washy depiction that uh only men exert violence or only uh or are, are the owners and the agents of violence but also women are and we see that also in Nausicaa's rage and another thing about Nausicaa is that she's shown uh, exhibiting very traditionally masculine skills she's in permanent action she's an expert in flying she responds to the problems she's always figuring out a plan etc etc so to tie into your idea Kasulu about um Kushana in some way being punished for straying from a female role I think it is way more that she is a completely female agent of violence but that the violence itself is the thing that corrupted and broke her because nothing specifically about her not being female ties into her bodily damage and her basically broken body but it kind of alienated her from her from from any romantic life or whatever not through a specifically female perspective but by by virtue of it being um of the violence being the corrupting force here yeah, and not the... her straying from her gender role okay i don't uh, disagree with any of that like because me saying uh kushana was like herself individually punished is is more like the film's um displaying of this idea because really the it, you could say it's a critique of the societies that she comes from and it does this with the pegites also where like we see clearly the Dondalk and the Pejites are cl two clearly very male centric societies, and they suffer because of that because they're all about like this expansionist, yeah, patriarchal ambition, and they're two sides of the same coin. As we see in a in really good comparative scenes, uh, there's the there's a little scene of the uh, people in the valley all um, working together to root out the sea of corruption that's spread to their trees, and we see men and women completely on equal playing field helping each other and in fact uh the old lady uh obaba is the one actually instructing them what to do so they're being led by a woman and having women do all the same roles as men do and then we cut directly to uh nazca meeting the pegites and they lock nazca up with all the other women in just like the back of the ship just like in the like they keep all their women locked away in just this one area they don't do anything they just all get st stay there and are clearly told what to do so clearly these societies suffer because they don't have any kind of female leadership and they clearly 
are driven by this masculine nature. As of course, right. um, the Pegites also say, like, oh, you know, if we if we didn't um, take out the God Warrior and try to reuse it for ourselves, the Dodork would have done it for us. So you know, they view everything still as this zero sum game where there's no peace. There is only kind of like defeating your enemy. Of note here is also that um, the the women bring Nausicaa the 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 dress that we see at the end, the red dress, and free her out of the prison in the in the airship. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. also that they transgress actively against the patriarchal mm. rule in that moment. But the women are much smarter than the men think they are. I think. I think the movie mess messes up a bit. It makes it a bit messy, which you can't really fault it for it because it has to condense the story. Because in the manga, it's the Dorok society, which is much more masculine focused, which is basically a slave, a slave owning a civilization. They are probably the most inhumane thing in the entire manga. And that KGT is not shown as that in the manga. It's more similar to the Valley of the Wind, which is also seen in that they have a princess. Like, the Dorok wouldn't care for a princess. Who cares? It's a woman. And that's the same with the women in the Pejit airship. Because the Dorok would absolutely do that. But the Pejitans, as depicted in the manga, wouldn't. I think it messes a bit with the theming of the story. But that's unavoidable. At, at any rate, uh, I would say that, uh, that Nausicaa and uh, Kushana, and to a lesser extent uh, Obaba, uh, are examples, uh, the, the uh, examples of... Um, of the leading ladies of, uh, of Miyazaki's uh, work, of, of both uh, the the Ghibli girl, as we understand it, and also these powerful women that that lead men that that are intelligent and uh, and use that intelligence for violence. And we're going to get some uh, some more uh, complex, uh, some more interesting examples of them. Uh, later on in uh, in this podcast series, but I still do feel my main point about Kushana being like from this, if not male centric herself and masculine, but at least her society and her entire um, command, as we see um, the uh, the guy who's with her, Kurotawa, Kurotawa, whatever his name is. The moment she's out of the picture, he's he immediately just assumes command. He's immediately like, ah, I, yes. I think I'll be in charge now, name? and he's looking at the God Warrior thinking like how cool this will make him, how he's a soldier and how he's going to destroy the world now. Of course, not realizing the irony that that's how the world got fucked up in the first place with this exact kind of thinking. And so she, clearly Kushana, from her at least one named character who supports her, has yeah, no respect. Guy. Like her, her men don't care about her. She's merely just another uh, person fitting the leadership role, unlike Nausicaa, who like not only commands the respect of every person in the valley but even uh converts uh what's his name asbel to turn on like his own leaders to help her out so that's another clear example of how the uh the the feminine leader is is the strongest in this work the court have a, he's a skimming bastard in the manga he's depicted as the guy he would he would betray anyone to get the throne he's the ultimate schemer in the background but somehow Kushana tames him, which only further illustrates how strong she is. And the manga makes more of a point how much of a valiant leader she is, and that all her soldiers love her. Yeah, I, I do agree with that in a way that um, I felt that Kushana was a really strong depiction and a really strong subversion as well of uh, like these common sense notions I just talked about. Uh, at the same time, later into the movie, you saw her come around to uh, the other position a little bit in in contrast to maybe her uh, yeah her her direct subordinate Kuno Um For instance, when if the this, plane this lands, something... when the pla when the plane lands in the end, I think at the start of the movie, uh, the character arc she went through, she would have uh, she would have I think she would have just shot the fucking plane uh, right then and there. But instead, she waited and and expected what was going to come, uh, which kind of indicates for me a sort of uh, kind of open-mindedness in a way, which maybe comes from her uh, being a woman in a super male-centric patriarchal society, uh, which which um, 
maybe causes her to kind of challenge the notions that are seen as common sense in her own society, which makes her maybe a bit more open-minded and uh, coming around, even though this is still very difficult, as was proven throughout the movie. Um, I think this encounter is best explored and best challenged in one scene in the film where both Kushana and Nausicaa, among the others, are trapped in the Sea of Decay in the in the forest. And Kushana is desperately struggling to exercise authority. Meanwhile, Nausicaa is acting, she's planning, she's doing. And when Kushana is threatening her to shoot her, like, I will shoot you if you continue doing anything, uh, then Nausicaa is just like, you can't shoot here, we will be fucked over by the insect, it will be... Uh, a problem and she's just basically ignoring Kushana's authority and acting in, in a rational interest. She's uh, basically going past her hubris, past pr the pride that Kushana exhibited. She wanted to claim, desperately claim authority in the situation because she, as a defense mechanism, claims authority, threatens violence, wants to control the situation out of being scared. That is uh, mirrored by the uh, moment uh, where uh, Nausicaa meets the 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 little uh, squirrel fox the first time teto right where uh, where the, she says basically the same thing and says kushana is like a, a squirrel fox right now she's just scared she's lashing out she, basically she's got to bite me then she can trust me that i can take care of the situation nausicaa claims control of the situation not by pride not by authority not by control not by violence but instead by non-violence by um positing the good decision and just taking the bullet basically well luckily she didn't take a bullet because <laughs> that would be she won't her. <laughs> but in in a sense we have again a thing uh, Nausicaa sacrifices a bit of herself endangers herself for the non-violent way here yeah in order exactly she yeah. she allows herself to be vulnerable yeah yes yeah i was thinking of that exact scene I was thinking about that exact scene in this clash for leadership and how Nausicaa's uh, feminine, uh, more passive and like understanding ideals just beat out Kushana's male-centric violence and how she almost talks down to Kushana like she's uh, her mother, like it's it's she's she's seen as like her weakest point in this film where she's just trying to to grasp some kind of power but doesn't realize that everyone here, all the men follow Nausicaa, and Nausicaa is not threatened by her whatsoever. Yeah, of course. That's, this is also what I uh, what I talked about with hegemonic masculinity, as is, she is kind of plagued by this in a way, uh, by this notion of hege hegemonic masculinity. She's comparing herself. What I forgot to mention is that in a hegemonic, in a society where hegemonic masculinity is present, uh, men... In this in this instance, as I as I uh, pointed out earlier as well, women in the form of Kushana, who were, who was in a high authority place, uh, despite being a woman, uh, are constantly compared and compare themselves to the ultimate ma hegemonic ideal of masculinity. So in a way, um, she is grasping for ways to uh, to take a claim on the hegemonic. She is grasping for strolls at this point, but she just can't find it, uh, which which uh, makes her lose her identity in a way. Exactly. Whereas uh, Nausicaa is is really confident being herself, not living up to some sort of ideal female or male uh, role she has to fill. Yes. So in a way, uh, Nausicaa is the ultimate subversion of uh, gender essentialism. Taking both uh, traits uh, that are that are classically uh, coded as feminine or masculine, totally subverts them into a sort of uh, gender neutral way of femininity. If if you see what I'm getting at, kind of. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not sure if it's the ultimate. I don't know if it's necessarily gender neutral because from all of Miyazaki's works I definitely get the reading that he does believe in gender roles for men and women but he just believes in kind of redefining the current ones that exist where like women can be more active and can be more um, competent and doing these things. But that that's, Hipster, that's where we have to be careful not to read his views of gender in, uh, into the book. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree to that but just seeing the rest of his films and the way that he has all of his female characters clearly act in a certain way it's not a gender neutralness i do believe that if you look at this there's a clearly a, a role for females oh, de definitely but uh 
Oh, it's it's definitely a, an ongoing uh, thing in his work. Th this uh, this idea of uh, the the man of the house, uh, the wise lady, stuff like that. Um, but uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it's uh, you're right that it could be that he has these ideas of gender roles and the role in society and what should be uh, be kept them, what should uh, change about them. But it might also just be that he he finds those kinds of characters fun to to. To write and to uh, and to make films about uh, that th that's what we need to be careful about, uh, which I talked about at the beginning, uh, s saying something about him and his beliefs uh, because of something we saw in his uh, his films, and not because uh, it's something he he talks about outside of them. Yeah, I agree, but I'm just saying purely reading through this film, I feel like there is a very strict way that. That women are supposed to be in the the leadership roles they should be fulfilling, and how it's almost always more important than a than a male leader, and how all the male leaders are not shown in the the best way, because the only ones we see are uh, the pegite leaders who are clearly wrong, they're the enemies in plot wise, and then we see uh, Nausicaa's father, who's just kind of like old and dying, and who clearly. Uh, isn't really like as important as Nausicaa is to the people of the valley. But but I think here you have to disagree a little because I don't think it is showing a should of women as leaders and how they should yeah. be and if a society should be run by women, but it is just defamiliarizing and subverting ideas of male leadership firstly. I don't think there's a specific exactly. direct implication to towards a should. It is more a description of an is statement and a subversion of that is statement. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Um, I don't think there is like a very distinct agenda behind this film for more of a matriarchal... Except for env environmentalism. Yeah, if, yeah, of course. Yeah. Not in the terms of gender. I think it's more of a, indeed a very powerful subversion of existing hegemonic ideals, of, of existing common sense notions about gender. It's, it's in a way an attack on those... Um, notions instead of uh, trying to fit them into some into some other kind of other construction okay maybe this is just a semantics thing or some sort of weird perspective but like i, I guess the way i kind of view it is he yeah he's intentionally subverting gender ideas but because like when you do that you clearly have other ideas that you think work better so like by showing uh, aunt nasca who is clearly this like perfect human being he's, yeah, all, he's um, in a way showing I, I would say how he thinks uh, people should be by subverting expectations so i guess i guess it's a weird semantics thing there i, I would say she's not necessarily the ideal woman uh, in any way but but she's obviously an idealized character and i think that's actually one of the uh, the weaknesses of uh, of nasica both the character and the film is uh, and and people have talked about th that a lot that she she just has all the good traits uh like she's um she's at once uh a nurturer a warrior an empath uh, a stern leader uh s someone who uh, goes out on their own uh to, to be alone and s someone who's really good with groups uh she's strong uh and strong-willed, but she's also prone to, uh, to 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 be sad and uh, and and to cry. There are several points, especially at the beginning part of the movie, where she uh, where she starts crying and uh, and and she has to be comforted. So that this this she she has all of it uh, at once, and uh, and and it's all good stuff. Like we get like this sensation, we get this line about how she was about to lose control or something but it, it doesn't really come up that much again she she is a perfect person yeah. uh, her, i would her say so. empathic power basically is her ability to decentralize her self-interest she's uh, able to view herself as part of her surroundings and in interaction with everything else and her basic idealism i would say is her fight, her, her struggle to preserve a world where the end doesn't justify the means by which we reach this end. Yeah, that's so, true as well. Yeah. Um, no, that, what I would like technique. to add on that is um, I want to get a bit more simplistic now. <laughs> it's going to get 
bit about my own opinion. I thought um, Nausicaa was a really awesome character. I don't know. I just, she really inspired me a lot. Um, I think she's just awesome in a lot of ways. She's like, she takes a lot of initiative. She's constantly active. She's constantly caring about others, constantly showing solidarity and understanding while uh, using what is needed to reach her goals. Uh, which I think yeah, I th is a very welcome uh, type of character in yeah, our and type. Especially from, from when this movie came out uh, yeah. in 19, uh, what was it, 84? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy how progressive she is as a character. Yeah, so I really, I don't really mind that much if she's idealized. Like what Miyazaki says as well is... Um, he has, he has said time and time again, I am trying to make a, he's trying to make a, a, a new ideal for young women. And I think that's really admirable. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I do think he succeeds. Yeah. I think one thing about her, one thing about her, she's the perfect character, but she's imperfect because she has lost control. And there are scenes like that in the manga where she isn't perfect. But it's not important. People can be forgiven. You can't, your aunt shunned because you overreacted once. I think Miyazaki is also a great advocate for forgiveness. And Kushana is, a, is an example of that because Kushana changes a lot in the manga. And Kushana is forgiven and becomes an ally of Nausicaa. I think that's a great thing about Miyazaki's stories. That he forgives his characters for, for being imperfect. And also... One of the inspirations for Nausicaa, or one of the prototypes, this is a graphic novel that I haven't read by Miyazaki from 1983, which he probably worked for on the, for a long time. I think, what does it, oh it doesn't say here, I thought it said he had been working on it since 1969, but that probably isn't true. The thing is, The Journey of Shuna, as this graphic novel is called, is about a boy prince and he is one of the inspirations for or one of the prototypes for Nausicaa and the prototype for Ashitaka of course. I think that's also a thing that he that his perfect person can be a woman, can be a man, has elements of both, combines the best of both, that he doesn't see the problem in gender necessarily. He sees it in the in the characteristics of the person, how they act, if they act like a good person, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, uh, I th I think um, I I'd like to say that like my my criticism isn't of uh, the manga. It's 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 of the the, the film where th that whole thing about her losing controlling and having to be forgiven doesn't really become anything it doesn't become a character arc in any way but there is definitely well, something to be said for it is a very symbolic act if i may interrupt because through the blood that Yupa, that lord Yupa sheds in soothing nausicaa it mirrors the blood nausicaa sheds when she's protecting the ohm child later on in the movie so it is maybe not an arc in the in the sense of the word that we understand it but it's a symbolic arc in a sense because it's reflected through it. The blood, the bloodshed, the self-sacrifice of Yupa is something Nausicaa learned in that scene and that she also applied later. And we see the same bloodshed, her bloodshed, soothing the Ohm and the Ohm's bloodshed later basically soothing the entire war that was raging at the end when her entire dress is dyed blue with the Ohm blood, right? Yeah, this that, is a that, recurring that, that, that little self-sacrificing scene when they're coming into the uh, sea of corruption and she just pulls off her mask to order the men on the other plane to let go of the cargo and they immediately like freak out and follow it. So even in like little actions, little interactions where she doesn't have to go that far to prove her point, but she will just for the sake of like them doing it faster and being safer. Yeah, she is very charismatic and very inspiring coincidentally. No, not so coincidentally actually. Also something charismatic that is coded masculine in our society. Um which I can go into if you want, but I don't think that's very productive. Um, so yeah, the very, uh, very inspiring character. Yeah, and, that, and there is something to be said for uh, for stories where the main character doesn't 
uh, change because the world has to change around them, uh, where we we where the entire thing is is structured around this um, th this character who is uh, in a way perfect, and others have to recognize that. But uh, at the same time, uh, I I th I think that as a as a film. Uh, it's it doesn't like feel quite as um, she, she doesn't feel quite as uh, as real and engaging as uh, some uh, other characters will find in his later work. Um, but, uh, but but I I totally see her as as a good uh, role model uh, for for girls especially who who might have lacked these kinds of role models back then. And and still kind of do, <laughs> yeah. Basically, that's Not all. The, <laughs> all the, this all comes yeah, down. Said to it. Yeah. He'll be mad. Yeah. <laughs> Miyazaki will be really mad at me. No, no, the, the, the doesn't. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure Miyaza Miyazaki. Uh, there's a quote from him where he he talked about. Um, I, 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 about his own yeah, yeah exactly that yes, he had that he, feeling but he doesn't like the term he doesn't like the term but he does describe like the the, the feeling of a very specific uh aff affinity affection for uh, a, a fictional female character i think he uh, said uh, yeah. Miyazaki is otaku in denial while anu <laughs> is western <laughs> fan in denial true as there's this line in a lot of creators that there are things in denial yeah i think he said about a character i don't know which one that she was his girlfriend in a time that he didn't have a girlfriend which is basically yes, a wife five, yeah. i mean i'm, yeah, I'm exactly. not sure if i'm mixed gotten. quoting this you have to check me on this don't quote me on this but i believe i've heard this somewhere it's, did this you quote. quote it it's probably wrong it's probably wrong but so whatever it will be roughly correct, so it doesn't matter. All right. I mean, I've paraphrasing. Movie. She's a nice wife, who I have to say, she's cute. So we've examined in depth now Kushana and Nausicaa. If we haven't anything to add to this, I would like to, to continue along our road, since we've gotten hung up on this discussion quite a bit. Except if there's any big points someone still has to add. Oh, one more point. Is it me, or was it like a very confusing visually? I have the, uh, the legend of the blue-clad warrior. And Nausicaa already spends like almost the entire film dressed in blue, but then I guess we find out at the end of the film it was a slightly darker shade of blue. Like, that was just a weird element. It, that, that's very interesting what you bring up. Well, the thing is, what I found really interesting about that is um, that we basically were led to believe it's Nausicaa, then she got the red dress and we were like, huh... Wow, how is it supposed to work out with a prophecy now? And then we learned the, the twist, the turn, basically. The blue color comes from the own blood. That is very interesting, in my opinion, because the, we were led to believe that it is, first of all, the, the, the prophecy kind of implied a man, right? So even the, the old lady in the end, when she envisions the, the prophecy, the blind lady, when she envisions her prophecy, she sees a man, and suddenly the man transmorphs into Nausicaa, who is now the uh, blue-clad warrior. That's a thought for a second there. That that old man or that young man, he was a bit reminiscent of a younger King Jill. That he was a similar figure for the valley. I think there's probably some symbolism in there, but oh, I, I was just thinking he was El Cantara. <laughs> well, that's that's a very I mean, good, it's it's also a, a direct theory. um reference to Buddhism, right? Because it, they talked about the golden fields, um at the same time. I think the direct quote, not the direct quote, but she said something like, um, um, the blue clad one is one who will lead us to the golden fields, which is... Uh, and that one shall come to you garbed in raiment of blue and descending upon a field of gold. Yes. Is the manga this one. is basically exactly Amida Buddhism, which is a form of Buddhism that was very popular in medieval Japan. Um, I think that exploration goes all the way in the manga, while the film to uh, to uh, have to get a point in by our absent guest or our absent member who wanted to be on this podcast but couldn't. The Thunderer, he said, he said that this movie has more of a Christian savior figure, while the manga has a more Buddhist savior figure, which I don't think is quite substantiated. But there is 
That is not entirely true because I mean the Buddhism has coincidentally has a lot of um I found at least similarities between Christianity because basically how it's constructed is that Yeah, for um, me that's one main point because he basically dies at the end of the film and is revived like Jesus. Which doesn't happen like that I, in the manga. I mean, yeah, but, maybe, but, but Jesus yeah. isn't uh, the only uh, savior character who ever dies and lives again. Yeah, but let me finish my thing about Amida Buddhism. It it's basically uh, how it goes down is um, in in opposition to Zen Buddhism, which is all which is all about personal salvation and personal. Um, uh, meditate salvation through meditation and if you if you meditate more enough you can reach enlightenment and it's very personal it's very individual uh, amida buddhism on the other hand is very popular it is um, if you believe in amida she will take you to uh, the true land or in this case the golden fields uh, which uh, i can i can complete the connection here with uh, referencing Buddhist art from the period, which is actually painted on on a silk, which is very unusual for Western painting. It's, it but the problem is um, silk is very see through. So what they did is on the back of the silk they painted it with gold leaf. So if you what if you if you would Google right now, um, Amida Buddhist art, you would see a lot of uh, golden backgrounds. Which later comes back in Edo period art as well, but uh, that's for another day. Um, uh, in this, and then you have this golden U that kind of comes from behind uh, the golden behind the pure land. And in these artworks, the pure land is often uh, it's often the pure land that is depicted in, in this golden kind of glow. So that kind of makes the connection between uh, a complete between uh, the savior that will bring us to the golden land and Amida Buddha, who will, after you die, will 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 bring you to the true land, which is not, which is actually just basically the same thing. And in interpreting the 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 prophecy, I also have a, a quite a lot to add. Because the initial pro prophecy, and this goes along very well with the entire seeming of the entire movie, the prophecy at first is understood as very anthropocentric, very human. The clothes are blue because humans dyed them blue, and the golden fields imply agriculture, imply golden fields, human-made cultivation of the land. But as it turns out, both the blue clothes are dyed by the Om, as well as the golden fields are the Om tentacles, the embrace of the Om, basically the synergy between the two. So instead of interpreting prophecy through a very anthropocentric lens, through a very human-centered lens, the true answer was a synergy with nature. And very interesting to add on to this about the Om, part of the uh, origin of the name of the Om is, is from the Om of, uh, of, of, of Buddhist tradition. Miyazaki said he not only f he played he uh, did he play around with, with, with some kanji that meant basically insect king or king insect, but the pronunciation Omu is very um, unusual for those kanji. So uh, he, he said that he took the, tr uh, uh, the pronunciation as well from this idea of Om, from Om, from, from Buddhism, which is part of mantras. For example, one mantra which is very, very famous, which I found which fits incredibly well here, is the, uh, and I don't know if I pronounce this correctly, the Om Mani Padme Hum, the mantra of the bod bod Bodhisattva of Compassion. And this mantra basically refers to a jewel lotus or a, a lotus jewel. And the lotus is a very fitting image here because uh, not only do we have the, the idea of jewels as in crystals in the purification in the CFDK, but the lotus itself is a plant that is associated with purity because it grows in mud. It grows in, in very bad soil and pulls the nutrients out of it and, and you have a beautiful flower that grows out of basically a bad soil. So oh, very the lotus itself seems to be very much like um, the the the... the it seems to hint at this connection between reaching the Om and and 
interacting and synergizing with nature, even though the Ohm uh, in, in Nausicaa are harmful and the nature is almost devastated, but we can be the lotus, we can grow out of it, we can purify it, and nature itself purifies. It's all about this idea of cleansing it in, in, a, in a compassion. So this prophecy has a lot of really Buddhist weight and beautiful imagery. imagery. So, yeah, um, that actually feeds very nicely into my interpretation of... Uh, the uh the buddhist enlightenment or uh as a as it took place in the movie which is indeed the em embrace of nature but nature but also um about understanding the viewpoint of an entirely abyssal other being right so uh this is where the conceptualization of umwelt comes in an umwelt that is something that um, was coined by a biologist, uh, Uxkul, uh, which is a very interesting name. I don't know how to pronounce it. Maybe you can help me, Njar. Um, can you put down the name for me so I can read it out loud? Yeah, yeah of course. It's uh, in the chat. You're calling it umwelt. Maybe we should call it omwelt. Am I right? Omwelt. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'll post yes. it right now. It all comes back around. Here. Here it is. Jakob von... What is that name? Do you know how Xkul. to pronounce that? Xkul. Xkul, I think. I would pronounce it Xkul. Xkul. Okay, okay. It's an Estonian name, apparently. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, he was, from the, he was German Germans. at the time, but he was from the Baltic, so... Anyway. Oh, yeah. Baltic German. Um, okay. One of those guys. Okay, Darkonius, please go on. I would... I would like to give details about the manga, but I forgot the manga, so Sif, come back to me once you've read the manga and tell me about how it feeds into the Buddhism angle, and maybe we'll talk about that in a Loose Ends episode of this podcast. Yeah, that is quite yeah. possible. So I... It was just a little interjection. Back to Umwelt. Yeah, so um, this article that was by, um, which I actually read for this um, thing, uh, I want to quote from it what it what it actually means because I wouldn't really be able to uh, produce a better example. Um, the umwelt as presented by a foray into uh, worlds and animals, the uh, by uh, the author Uxko, uh, and commonly transla as translated as environment, is based on the perception and cognitive capacities of unique creatures. All creatures. Uh, be they beetles, butterflies, gnats, or dragonflies who populate a meadow, have a soap bubble around them, closed on all sides, which closes off their visual space, in which everything visible for the subjects is also enclosed. Um, I don't know if you got that, but it basically means that every creature has its own kind of perception that is limited and can't be, really be overcome. So in my interpretation, and also interpretation of this article, is um, is um, uh, the article is by, I should probably credit it, it's, uh, it's a bit nicer to do, it's, it's by Adnan Mutovic and Denise Nunes, Denise Nunes, I'll be sure to link it, because it's a very interesting article. Basically, how they interpret it, uh, Nausicaa, is, is, is to overcome this kind of umwelt, or at least to have some kind of connection between the two. Maybe you can envision it as some kind of uh, uh, circle graph that has overlapping parts, you know, uh, in, in the way that umwelt is also constructed as a circle. Um, so... Um, Right off the bat, from this uh, conceptualization of Umwelt, it is very much uh, nonsensical to place different Umwelts in a hierarchy, if you can come behind that. Like, if, you are, if your perception is limited to a certain, uh, in a certain way, it is very irrational to see that your perception is somehow truer or better than the, the perception of another organism. Um, from this also uh, flows a sort of critique of um, of rational a priori, uh, pure rational a priori science that puts uh, in indeed the anthropocentric that puts the the humans' unworld as the universal unworld of the world. 
uh, which is uh, which is uh, a problem, which is movie also addresses. Um, so basically, in challenging the anthropocentrism yes. and what we talked about earlier, that Nausicaa tries, or at least uh, tries to reach into the other creature's umwelt by doing a perspective shift. I mean, yes. she has. A, we have a scene where she literally looks through the world through the lens of the ohm, right? She puts on his, the lens of the of the ohm's eye. She does a perspective shift and she allows umwelten to collide. Yes, that is very. Yeah, that's very interesting indeed. Um, and at the same time, it ties into the, the whole uh, theme of of this arrogance of, of people to think that they they understand uh, what the the, the na what nature is is, is doing as uh, as as some somehow amoral and and they they can just uh, defeat the entire forest uh, and. Uh, reclaim this great uh, humanity yeah. they don't see the perspective of uh they don't see the umwelt of these bugs who are in a way a sort of global immune system exactly uh, that that, that so, is fixing the world yeah we also get the perspective of the uh the ohm looking into a uh, nausicaa's mind and there's that scene where the tentacles surround her and we get like a a vulcan mind meld with their seeing into her memories and we get the the little flashback sequence and then also in the manga, she like psychically communicates with the arm. Yeah, exactly. So there, there's different points in the movie where Nausicaa kind of reaches out and and breaks out this umwelt. There's one one example. Of this is with the uh, with the eye, indeed, that she's looking through perspect, perspect, uh, perspective. And of course, at times when she comes into contact with uh, with the golden, which comes back to, of course, the Buddhist. Uh, interpretation the golden uh tentacles of the ohms um and of course it's it's this uh it, there's can be a very powerful criticism of um of anthropocentrism but also rational science by extension of that which this article again has a very nice quote on and please don't attack it I, this is the last time i'm going to quote this article but um i found it was very enlightening so i wanted to share it with everyone um, it goes like this. The problem with reliance on scientific rationality is that it compresses the entire buzzing, howling, gurgling biosphere into the narrow vocabulary of epistemology. This epistemology here referring to, um, yeah, maybe Nyard can explain this better than me after the quote is done. Um, it is in the perceived silence surrounding the human subject. Uh, so the um, the inadequacy to to perceive other beings as being a subject instead of an object to be studied, um, that an ethics of exploitation regarding nature has taken shape and flourished. This uh, again also comes to the high the, to the, comes back to the spaceships that the uh, that the empire had that kind of defy nature and don't work with it. Um, the silence is, however, not an actual silence, but one that has been created by an a priori limitation of what it is that can be regarded as a speaking subject, as well as what, as what it is that can be regarded as a valid for valid form of communication. So, um, the valid form of communication is very important here where we see human speech as the only way to uh, recognize each other in a way and not any other type so the form of communication with nausicaa between the ohms with the tentacles is in a way a really revolutionary and uh, breaking of this kind of perception of this kind of uh, bubble thinking in a way I found it very interesting that the Ohm are not in any way anthropomorphized, as in they are not in any way approximated to humans to yes. make them more understandable. Instead, they are... Tr well, no, they have tentacles. That's their most anthropomorphic thing, and they have eyes. It's... Uh... Very no, I mean, no, humans it's don't it, have tentacles, and do humans don't have bug eyes. I mean... You sure? I mean... 
Oh, sure? hipster Kasuna might have tentacles. True. It's true. But also, actually, the the, <laughs> I mean... the blue and red eyes to kind of symbolize very like a face, like moods of anger and calm. I think that is kind of an anthropomorphic. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a very yeah. basic way, um, as you can. See, you mean uh, insects they are anthropomorphized... as a motif is very is a very uh, is something that is used almost exclusively in science fiction to uh, to evoke a sort of abyssal other sort of uh, complete otherness that cannot be bridged um, this is how it's used in our culture in, in a myriad of ways and it's also that the lack of a common language is, is basically the point of this umwelt that human hubris has basically assumed that because they don't speak our language we cannot consider them as relevant for our epistemological as a knowledge seeking knowledge gaining gathering pursuit to understand the world around us but in 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 Nausicaa, uh, I mean, we can talk about that the fact that the Ohm are to an extent anthropomorphized in that they can show outside emotion and they have something resembling a face. But we might find agreement in the fact that they are not more anthropomorphized than a real insect in our world as anthropomorphized, as in they have also bug eyes, yeah. they have also incomprehensible shapes to us. So in that sense, the Ohm do not have a shared communication except the one that Nausicaa bridges with them through her through her superpower, basically, which we described earlier as a ability of herself to decenter her human anthropomorphic um, hubris, basically, and become and see herself as one with the nature continuum. So this is what we can see in Nausicaa. She considers insects subject. She isn't... She doesn't fall into the same trap like the Tolmechians who, who say... Uh, and, and the others who say we need the god warrior, we need to reclaim the land, we need to destroy the insects, humans and insects can't live in the same world, basically. But instead, Nausicaa considers the insects, finds their place, finds their reason, and finds their and finds their emotional state relevant as something to be considered, which is why she learns about the synergy, about the symbiosis that's going on, about the cleansing. She is able to view the insect which is so different such an other not as something to be exploited and destroyed and gotten rid of but as something to be a part of to work with to interact with to that everything is alive basically around her and everything interacts in these ways exactly yeah, and i think i think that is the most essentially miyasaki thing that uh, that that's, that begins here uh n not uh, not the flying scenes, not the uh, the gender roles, uh, not the animation style, but this um, w what I like to call fantastic empathy. Uh, the the heroes of Miyazaki's stories uh, are to some extent defined by their uh, their heroism is defined by their ability to find uh, empathy for even the craziest things in the craziest situations. Um, not only uh, empathy uh, for non-human alien entities uh, like uh, bleeding f uh, flying dragons uh, in uh, Spirited Away uh, or in, the, in this case gigantic bugs um, or, or, or even a, a weird magical uh, mermaid toddler in Ponyo. <laughs> um, but also empathy for evildoers uh, for instance, in, uh, in in Spirited Away, for for example, where uh, what your hero has to uh, to have empathy for No Face, this monster, this uh, all-consuming monster, or in Howl's Moving Castle, where it, it's basically an anime series where all the villains become good guys. It's um, it, it's this the the, the finale, the the big climactic moments of Miyazaki films are often tied to some sort of empathic plea uh, and i think that's one of the um, the most valuable parts of his uh, body of work i think there's a nice difference to another creator to hideaki anno who as we said was shaped by his work with miyazaki but he has similar creatures with his space monsters with the uchu kaiju in gunbuster but there he presents a bad end of the story basically where the communication isn't possible and where humans use their science their, their own uh, perspective and have to use it to defeat the nature to destroy the nature instead 
of cooperating with it, living yeah, with that's it. Interesting. And they are, they, they basically use Jupiter to make a black hole bomb and destroy the center of the yeah. galaxy. I mean, Gunbuster is very apocalyptic in some yeah. of its imagery. That is the bad end to a Nazca's good One end. One could say I that, like that say. Arno is the uh, the bio death laser robot, where Miyazaki is the uh, the blue clad hero in the golden field. That's th <laughs> those are like the two responses, yes, uh, w w which are cool and interesting in their own ways. Um, I mean, I see why both are friends and why they respect each other. They have very different but also very similar perspectives i think mm -hmm. they're very interesting creators both there's also something very peculiar that um miyazaki does with the motif of insects uh, this maybe comes back to the eastern and western perspective or when it comes to religion at least maybe that um because in many sci-fi movies insects are often portrayed as like um sort of sub always as uh, subjugated by some sort of uh absolute authority so there's basically a mother or a or a patriarchal insect that yeah. has a absolute authority queen. yeah like a hive absolute authority over mother the bog. over the little little insects and takes over the world and it's absolute subjugation ultimate authority but uh miyazaki how he pre uh how he constructs the insects is very different he constructs them as a sort of uh, homogenous swarm consciousness, consciousness. So no insect is above the other in a way. Um, they all share the same experiences and share the same um, uh, consciousness. And by doing this, they understand they are fundamentally uh, super a super intelligent being at the same time, because in their swarm consciousness, they understand what uh, has to be needed in the long term to uh, save their their uh, to save the planet so in a way the insects are much more open-minded and much more intelligent than many of the humans that inhabit the planet in the way that they are in constant communication with each other and constantly have uh, this um, love and care for uh, the planet and have this long-term solutions for this huge problem and in a way they have ultimate intelligence in that they can see what has to be done in order to save the earth uh, i don't know if that's actually true considering the film i mean you could use, maybe use the context of the manga later on but in the film the oma portrayed as like uh, just a natural part of the world now, along with the uh, the forest of yeah, decay. Nature. But uh, as we can clearly see, they were very easily like enraged and just act as a, a purely instinctual thing. Because we get the idea that they do have some intelligence, as with the tentacles show, but they are just easily led to attacking the valley by the uh, the wounded baby. That that is because they have a shared project, and their shared project is the decontamination of the earth. Um. They basically sideline humanity in a way. Uh, yeah, the Om decide yeah. the Earth is more important than the Valley yes. of the Wind. Yeah, wind, exactly, and which, uh, which is convinces them is not the case. Which is exactly why Nausicaa is uh, is is a, a savior not only of humanity but in a way also of the Ohms, uh, because they uh, they can't see uh, past their project. Uh, any more than uh, humanity can see past the project of rebuilding what was lost, what they thought was glorious, but actually just screw the world up. Yeah, but um, in a way, yeah. um, it's very different because the Ohms have uh, a mutual understanding of what has to happen, and humanity, in a way, is very divided, very uh, constantly at war. They don't understand each other, they misunderstand each other. Um, they are destructive to each other. Um, but the Ohm are not like this. They act in a homogenous... They have a common project, a common goal. They uh, they act homogeneously. Of course, environmentalism is a very important thing for Miyazaki. And Ohm are portrayed as protecting environmentalism. Whereas most of the humans, except for Nausicaa, 
are uh, seen as um, attacking this concept that Miyazaki finds so important. And this is where the umwelt comes in. Because to join the insects in their project, it is important to see their point of view, understand why they do what they do, to see that it is intelligent and not of blind race. So you have to reach the un the umwelt, which is exactly what, what Nausicaa does at the end of the movie, in order to see what is needed. And uh, to break the umwelt is, of course, not something that is easy. As I said, it's very limited. You're limited to your own perception. And uh, it is very hard to step outside of that. But there's a multitude of ma methods that are showed in the movie to be that can be done in order uh, for this to happen. One of this, this is abolish uh, verbal communication as the only form of valid communication. So uh, there we have the tentacles, obviously. Yes, the tentacle scenes where um, there is a, a very intimate form of communication where um, Nausicaa is into contact with this form consciousness of the insects and uh, understands them in a very fundamental way. This uh, occurs a couple of times in the movie um, where the umwelt is subverted in a way or um, she can see part of the other umwelt but not embrace it as much as in at, at the end of the movie. Um, so yeah, expand the meaning of valid communication. Um, another way oh, is... Hentai artists will agree with you. Tentacles are better than words. Yes, of course. They are. <laughs> Objectively, of course. Um, and One thing I'd like to say is that hive minds as the OM are, I don't think they are that unique. I mean, Gunbuster uses them, probably in yeah. imitation, but I think I've seen them before. But that is right. A lot of alien species that are insect-like, like in StarCraft, the Zerg, they have queens, they have the overmind in the original game. That is a very common... Yeah, yeah or, very or, common or the alien image. queen from uh, from Alien 2. Aliens. Oh, aliens. Yeah, yeah or, the, or the Borg queen, because the Borg are also a kind of insect hive mind in a way. The Borg queen's really dumb. But <laughs> well, yes. But it's, that's another story. Also, of... I, there was a point I forgot to make. I was going to make a point that Ripley in Aliens is basically Narsica, but uh, I didn't get around to it. I was <laughs> going to get to the point well, that... Maybe for uh... later, because I'm almost done here. Um, thank you for your, your uh, addition, by the way, Darv. Um, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Uh, th that's coming later. Um, from uh, Another way is to go from the micro to the macro and a sort of oscillation between the two to um to understand swarm consciousness you can um what nausicaa does as well in the movie it understands an individual but at the same time the individual the macro is is constructed within the individual within the micro because of swarm consciousness right so what she does she interacts with multiple individuals and she finds a uh, in this, in this, she finds a sort of macro understanding of what, how the in insects act, how they, um, how they think. This is the same. Like if you, if you're trying to understand something, you cannot just have n is one. Of course, you have to have multiple ways, multiple things, interactions with multiple uh, different instances of the type of things that you're trying to study in order to understand it thoroughly. Um, and then, of course, after you've, do you've done all of this, you might finally reach uh, a point where you can break the world and totally understand, come into the mindset completely of the so-called abyssal other. And this is the goal in my mind uh, of this movie, or at least it's trying to say um and it is so ascend this this part is so uh so so much ascending it's a, it's a sort of enlightenment if you want to come back to the buddhist uh iconography this is what um in my interpretation what what 
what reaching the true land is all about. It's about understanding the abyssal other and understanding uh, and, bra and totally breaching the umwelt in the way that you understand uh, the other so completely that you become one with them in a way. Um, and this is what happens at the, in the final scene of the movie where uh, Nausicaa um, reaches the golden land and uh, and understands and becomes for a momentary time becomes part of the of the Ohm's swarm consciousness and becomes integrated in their biological communication system uh, in a in a very complete way uh, and this is um, what really the enlightenment or the breaching of the umwelt and and the conclusion of the movie is all about for me yeah that that definitely works out because um in the manga that continues on also um and Nasuka definitely literally starts psychically communicating with the ohm and there's even one scene where she's saved by being like vored by one of the ohm and it like almost integrates her biology into it in order to save her from yeah. the sea of corruption yeah, yeah the, the, I definitely the think it's a very, very prevalent theme. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. That sounds hot. So yeah, that that is kind of the enlightenment to become one with this form consciousness and to establish a sort of at least understand the collective consciousness and work with it and uh, respect it as some kind of something that knows more about the planet than you in a way. <laughs> It yeah, is. It's, it, it's it's such an interesting and multifaceted uh, ending because it fits into that idea of umwelt and the idea of fantastic empathy and, and the uh, and all the the Buddhist uh, imagery uh, and and essentially the hive mind as a sort of nirvana. Yes. Um, and even uh, and on top of all of that, uh, lots of Westerners will see a lot of uh, Christ imagery in it. Uh, there's there's a lot going on uh, and it's you could say uh, there's some genericness to it that it's because it's such a classical tale of a sacrificial hero but at the same time it's it's so unique in its own uh, it, it it's biopunk nothing yes very little else is really biopunk and also Miyazaki himself later stated that he didn't think the ending was was a, was great as it was because he was dissatisfied with the way Nausicaa came off as a sort of religious messiah figure. I think he was much more aiming at the sort of profound nuance that Sith is uh, is, is telling us about here. One thing yeah, I exactly. like to uh, think about, didn't the Ohm basically achieve insect instrumentality? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. I, once again, undertaking from Miyazaki. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, I mean, every, everyone takes from... Miyazaki, like, uh, well, all animators Miyazaki since doesn't. him. I mean, it's it's nearly impossible. Miyazaki doesn't to... give a fuck, I can tell you that. But then again, he's Miyazaki. He doesn't even care about the stuff he adapts, I think. He just puts his style on it, no matter what. Exactly, and I think it's, it's amazing that uh, it's such a treasure trove of a, a debut film for this team. It's, it's filled with, uh, like I mentioned at the very beginning, these, these parts that will go again and again, but at the same time, it's got all these uh, unique and influential uh, images and ideas uh, that would reverberate uh, in uh, anime of, in the future. Oh, and to be fair, there's one thing about this production. Most of them have worked together before because, of course, Takahata produced this, and he's been a big figure in the industry since the early 70s. So is Miyazaki in a way, and a lot of the animators also collaborated with them before, which is also, we should know that we shouldn't forget that this isn't yeah. just Snap, now there's the great studio, this came together over a decade. Yeah, of course, they, they all came from somewhere, they all came from somewhere, and, uh, but it's still, it is tempting to, uh, when we, we see it as the start of, uh, of Ghibli, uh, to to see it as as a beginning and not not as a part of a continuum. May, maybe that's what we should learn from 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 this. That that it's all part of the uh, the continuum of nature 
and of yes. anime history, I guess. I mean, I do <laughs> think it breaks the mold in this history of Takahata Miyazaki work, because this is the first time Miyazaki comes as an auteur, and the first time they were really working on all cylinders, where you have yeah. all the power, all the great animation, all the great auteur work, because a lot of Takahata works before for either TV series that couldn't quite couldn't quite reach the potential, although apparently they did. I haven't watched this TV series regard regrettably. His movies are a lot of them are early 70s and couldn't reach their height because of that, because the great animators would really come into a, their own in the 80s, where all the great animation happened, most of the great animation happened. And that, that's why this film is really important, because it's the first all cylinders production of these people. Yeah, but it would not be the last, and that's what yeah. we're here for. Yeah, the next twenty something. <laughs> I, I I think um may, maybe it's time we wrap it up. Uh, I, I don't know. If, yes, I, I think agree. I still have a couple of loose ends actually, because there's a couple of there's a couple of points about the aesthetic that I didn't have in the beginning. There's a couple of things like the garden, how the garden characterizes Norska and the entire nature. That really shows us that the nature nature is still pure, that it isn't corrupt. And I mean, the garden yeah. is one of the most beautiful things in all of anime. It's a great scene. It's a great place. Seldom has there been a better thing than the garden in Norska, in that deep down in that mountain. I think that was very symbolic of her caring nature, of the good nature of nature. Of everything this film wants. Yeah, we should have got a cameo from the organic farming guy from only yesterday. He would have loved yes. that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> organic oh, yeah. farming is the way to go. But anyways, uh... did the did the Digivo Ghibli cast use that as its cover? The garden. I'm not sure. I think it did. Yeah. I mean, the decompression chamber used lots of cuts from that. Zoomed in one little part of the garden, made it as a hundred <laughs> images in there. It's an amazing piece of art. Probably the best thing in the movie. So, I also have one uh, loose end to tie up. Because I realized, specifically because we were talking so much about the idea of... Um, that Specifically when Mono, Avara, Mono no Avara came up, I was uh, corrected that there's also a Western counterpart to these ideas. And I want to pro provide such a Western counterpart to Sif's Buddhist conclusions from the Umwelt and the whole body of theories that we discussed earlier. Because, in a sense, it is also challenging, it is primarily challenging, the very anthropocentric idea that the Western philosophical canon of enlightenment brought with it. Basically, the idea that the human is the subject there to perceive and control and order the world, and with it and, uh, with it and enlightenment, c certain ideologies and religions, uh, and not religions, uh, rejection of religion arose, and certain ideologies which, as we could see, cre turned, twisted, cultivated, destroyed, attacked, but also shaped the world in very certain ways out of a very human perspective. Humans making everything their own. So it is similarly completely possible to read uh, not a Buddhist enlightenment, but a rejection of the confusing terminology but a rejection of the western enlightenment era philosophy going past that and step taking a step back to evaluate our actions and how our anthropocentric attitude affects the world around us yeah of course there there came the that's also where my my uh quote that i said about the critic the criticism of of uh of pure reason of uh, pure rational science that that kind of uh, have, puts the the human as the investigating subject of all objects around it, uh, without actually recognizing other subjects. Into that fits into that kind of narrative very nicely. So I yes. would definitely agree with that. Yeah. All right. So before we let the things that come to start with the Nausicaa episode one Nausicaas to an end, do we have any more loose uh, ends? I, I yeah, one I have or two the... ones that I would add. Uh, one okay, that I just kind first, of forgot. Because mine is the comedy outro, I think. Yeah, this is yeah okay. <laughs> kind but of one I kind thing. of forgot was um, in that comparison scene between the uh, people in the valley destroying the uh, trees in order to save the valley. 
Oh, we also then see the Pajit city that's been like completely wrecked, completely destroyed. The their own people like uh, burned the whole thing to the ground, and they kind of just said, "Oh, well, we can just we can just rebuild it." It's like uh, I said back to like this um, aggressive male idea of, "Oh, we can just take over more land, or like we we can win the next round," opposed to like actually trying to preserve what you have and the community. Like the colleague didn't care; they think they can just get away with it. So I thought that was a that feeds back into the other themes. Also, as for the religious symbolism, while I agree probably there was more Buddhist and Shintoist inspiration, I do think that um the whole god warriors are um a very Christian thing, or at least Judeo, because not only do we get the seven days of fire, which seems like a direct reference to the seven days of creation, in which, you know, the earth was made in seven, so it was destroyed equally in seven. But the god warriors themselves are almost like angel-like figures they have like literal flaming weapons they have wings in the the manga but i don't think they're shown in the film and also they the whole thing is almost like a sodom and gomorrah like ideal like the humans brought about this own destruction for their own sins of like industrialization and pushing forward this warlike world so they're rightly punished for it i mean moreover the God Warriors are literal angels in Ava. Mm, yeah, that's that's true. There can there was a clear inspiration. They're basically the same thing as I said before. A clear inspiration. There's the clear line that the angels are inspired from Kaiju and from the God Warriors. The God Warriors are also probably inspired by Kaiju at least a bit, I think, or by Ultraman and stuff like that. I think there is something oh. in them. But what gave that away? The fact that they were giant and fight lasers out yes, of their mouths? I mean, also the kaiju themselves are uh, linked with the tradition of the atomic bomb, right? Gojira being a reaction yeah, to yes. the atomic bomb. So we have another weapon of mass destruction which burned the do uh, world down in a, in a blazing inferno. Sounds pretty much like an atomic bomb to me. So yeah, there's, there's a link, certainly. Also, I wouldn't go amiss without mentioning uh, Disney putting uh, the effort forward, making actually a pretty good dub for Nausicaa, while the Japanese is still a, a nice version. Really all star-studded cast with this one, where you had like Uma Thurman, Edward James Olmos, Patrick Stewart as Lord Yupa, which is a fantastic pick, and... Uh, oh yeah, Thundera was always lauding that one, that Yupa was the great one. Pretty, pretty much a, a great dub. I, I even think Nausicaa's voice in the English sounds a bit more like a girl and is a bit more fitting than her Japanese uh, via... It's time to shit on Makoto Shinkai because he copied a part of this movie. A very specific yes. scene. If Ooh. anyone of you has watched Children Who Chase Lost Voices, the flashback scene in that movie and the flashback scene in this movie with this relief on Wait, everything. Is that the movie where Shinkai is trying to uh, rip off Miyazaki? Yes. And we'll get to <laughs> oh that in God. the next podcast with Laputa and also in, an, in a couple of other ones, I think. I'll take note of those. But it, it's Especially this flashback scene with the relief. In this movie, it looks very painterly. It looks beautiful how they do it. In Shinkai's film, they don't go back to uh, this kind of aesthetic. They go back to the mid 20th century, such a kind of area, and they just put a filter over it. It looks like a filter where everything has relief. It looks terrible. <laughs> oh and it's the best God. looking part of the film. That's the worst <laughs> thing. Mm. He just That's copied funny. that for a really boring scene, which doesn't say much in that movie. But basically, Shinka is a hack and deserves to be killed. That's my point. <laughs> no. <laughs> deserves to be don't killed. Don't kill him. Don't kill him. Don't kill him. Don't kill him. Have you learned Shinkai. nothing Here's from Nausicaa? Have you learned nothing of pa Guys, pacifism? Guys, I lied when I said we weren't elitist. This is where it is. I am the elitist <laughs> king and Shinka deserves death. Don't disagree with me. I need to... I need to hate this guy. His movies are too bad. This podcast formally uh, disavows uh, Darkonius' <laughs> uh, ideas just now. Yeah, we are not we are not in favor of killing people. You know, it's not, generally not a very good thing to do. Can we get a compromise of life imprisonment so that so we can't make any movies <laughs> anymore? That seems fair. <laughs> That seems fair enough to me. All right. Okay. All right, then. I hope that was bearable. Thanks for listening to the cast. Please add to the discussion in the comments. We're looking forward to your thoughts. And we might do follow-up episodes if we receive interesting discussions in the comments and are corrected on our many, many mistakes. 
If you liked it and want to support us, please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash Nausicaas with a double A that is, link in the description. As of yet, the Patreon is pretty bare bones, but bear with us, we are working on it and we are going build to build it up properly in the future. See you next month when we are going to uh, when we are going to talk about Castle in the Sky. It is. Bye bye guys. See ya. <laughs> Love you. I'm gonna watch old anime. I'm watching you. <laughs>